Uh, Alex no. Jones is with us. He's an Austin-based producer, director, writer, and documentary filmmaker, as well as host of The Alex Jones Show, which appears on both syndicated and internet radio. He is also the founder of InfoWars, the multimedia enterprise. He has been banned by many prominent social media outlets for a range of alleged violations, although his Twitter account was recently restored. Welcome to the show, Alex Jones. Wow, Jimmy, I've been a big fan of you for a long time, and uh, you're one of the only men who spit I've had in my mouth. So I just <laughs> okay. want to say that uh, I've also had Willie Nelson spit in my mouth. Oh, okay. but I, my mouth was open when you spit at me like a spitting cobra and went right in my <laughs> mouth. So Christ. you and Willie Nelson have both been in my mouth. No, I stand by. You put that on your headstone? I stand. I put that on my headstone, but I stand by that you were being <laughs> funny because you were being funny. Uh, you were saying. You go. You said to Jake Uger, "I'm trying to be nice," and uh, that was funny to me. <laughs> and let me here. Let, let's just show it. Here, I'll show it. What happened? Here it is. Oh, no, Jake, relax. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where are you, Saudi Arabia? You dumbass. We talk about that all the time. Oh, right, we right. talk about that all the time. Oh, you're you're right. Right. Shit. <laughs> what do you think? The loser people are in charge? No. Is that what you think? Hey, you're pissed. You're you're pissed. Your ass. Is that what you think? You're the anti-liberal and you're pissed. Bullshit. We're being nice here. You, you know what I care about? I care, I, care about I care about the American people. Good. You're the one flipping out. Anybody hurt? I'm being nice. I'm not lying. Get the fuck off my stage. Okay, so that there was the the ice tea incident, and uh, the ironic thing is that the I thought this was going to blow up into a huge fight, fist fight, because Jenk Uger's was out of his mind, and uh, you had baited him pro correctly and professionally, and you got exactly. I couldn't believe he he was handling it that way. He's a way. brawler, it, and you know he <laughs> likes Jake's a brawler. He likes to say he's a brawler. And but it it did diffuse almost immediately after that. Like uh, every everybody kind of walked away from that. But well, uh, if you watch if you watch the full clip, I mean, it was one of the most viral things I ever did. And, and people thought I snuck on your stage, like at your offices. No, it was at the RNC, 2016 in Cleveland, and it was a huge uh, parking garage that they'd sealed up with big air conditioners in July. And so we were all milling around. I walked by, said hi to them. I, I've been on the show a few times. They said, yeah, maybe we'll have you on later. And I came back by and they were on break. So I went up there and gave him a Bill Clinton's a, a rapist T-shirt. And he just completely blew up when he saw Roger Stone walking by and said, Roger, you're not going to crash my show. And so then I thought it was all a joke. And then he got madder and madder and madder and madder. And then he went on air basically and said, we're here in our studio. And he got into the building and, and basically acted like I had like a James Bond snuck in. Instead, it was out in the middle with, with with other shows 15 feet away, booths everywhere. You guys had a big stage. So that's the truth of that story, and it was a lot of fun. So, <laughs> so no, you, you, obviously you didn't sneak into the building because there was security uh, letting everyone in. You had to go through security to get in, and, of course, you couldn't sneak in with a camera crew. And we had seen you. I'd seen you walking back and forth uh, earlier that day, and uh, so we knew you were there. I didn't know that somebody had invited you onto that stage. I know you had been on Jenk's show before. He had interviewed you at least a couple of times that I saw. So uh, I didn't know that was going to happen. And I Let me be clear, because I don't want to be deceptive. You guys had the big, one of the main stages. It was only like two or three in the whole building. Everybody else had little booths. Right. Hundreds of broadcasters. I walked by, and I said, hey, you want me on? They said, yeah, come back later. And so... The, 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 he wasn't like get on the stage they're like yeah come back later i was like sure i went and did like 30 minutes of more interviews was walking back by he's like we'll be right back i thought hey jumped up to troll him a little with the t-shirt so it is true that i did jump up on the stage i wasn't invited but i knew him it was during a break it was in the middle of the crowd uh so half of it's true half of it's not what he said but i certainly didn't you know cat burglar into the studio okay very pro wrestling okay but yeah, um yeah and the the crazy thing to me was that uh, I went to play Austin, Texas. My first time I was playing Austin, and I was eating at that steakhouse across from the Westin. And swear to God, you came in and you were seated right behind me. And I was like, "Oh my God, Alex Jones is going to kill me," <laughs> because uh, because you could. You're much bigger than me, and you could crush no. me. But hey, uh, I thought it was funny. I, listen, I'm a. I, I love your comedy. I love your show. You're going to get in trouble for this, okay. but I'm a big fan. So is my wife. 
We watch almost every episode. Oh, that's very sweet. Which, which is a lot. Uh, and so, no, I think you're one of the best uh, political brains out there, and you're fair. You're exposing the whole political system is rotten, controlled by big corporations like BlackRock, who are now starting World War III, and you've really the whole time stood up for my free speech, and I appreciate that. You got it a little wrong what happened with the whole school shooting thing and what I really said and what I didn't say. Uh, so if, I don't want to even say the name of it, but if, but if that comes up, I can tell you what really happened there. That was all PR firms taking one thing out of context, blowing it up years later as a way to try to take me off the air. Okay, so yeah, well, I do actually want to talk about that. But first, I want to show this. You were on with uh, Tucker Carlson, and he said this. When you got deplatformed, and it, to this day, no one has ever been more aggressively censored, I don't think, than you. Um, I've apologized to you this in person before. I was in Labrador on a fishing trip and missed the entire thing. I was literally out of cell range. Um, I didn't know what happened, but I got back, and I, was sh and I read about it. I felt like it was a major moment in the history of the American media. I don't think anybody defended you when that happened. Anybody with any kind of audience. For me, when Tim Cook. Had so I just want to, I want to correct the record on that. And uh, I actually did defend you the day it happened. And ever since, here I am on uh, the, in the Young Turk studio. And I couldn't believe that they did this to you and that uh, everybody at the Young Turks was going along with it. They're supposed to be an independent news show. Of course, now we know they're not. They're corporate funded. And so here, watch this. Why are we so afraid that human beings can't decipher for themselves what to believe and what not to? This isn't the first time there's been alternative publications spouting news that went against the establishment. You get to do that in America. You get to say, you know, uh, I remember uh, the biggest fake news story of the Washington Post published was that uh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. That wasn't just some jag off in the Washington Post. That was their editorial board saying that so again so this that this is not a slippery slope we're already we've already slipped once you ban anybody you're there right they've already suppressed us they're doing that right now and now they're just going to go to full out banning so are you that, struck that apple took down all of his content i am struck that that's pretty like so all along, they were okay all this time. He has, what, two, over 2 million subscribers or something? 2.5 on YouTube. That's crazy. So all of a sudden that they just go, we're done. I, you know, I think it's the worst thing that could happen, you know, especially with the advent that we don't have, you know, a freedom on the internet, that it's all going to be controlled and they're taking our voices away and they're really taking away access to unify people through ideas, through information. So um, it's interesting that we can be lied to to get in wars. We can be lied to about that we torture. But um, all of those, you know, those uh, those presses, they, they, they can thrive and continue to take ad revenue and commercialize war. Oh, no doubt about it. The way to debunk Alex Jones isn't to, to suppress his speech. That makes him a martyr. It actually lifts him up and makes more people interested in what he has to say. And then his all his accusations of the establishment suppressing him ring true because it actually is happening. This this antidote for bad speech in a free, open society is not suppression of that speech. The antidote to bad speech in a free and open society is more speech. You don't all of a sudden start saying, well, I have a secret group of billionaire, uh, Silicon Valley billionaires, and they're gonna decide what's actually free speech and what's not. They're gonna protect us. I don't need them to protect us. I don't need some Danny state. I don't need the government to protect me from harmful speech. I don't need a billionaire in Silicon Valley to protect me from harmful speech. I've been exposed to harmful speech my entire goddamn life. Nobody, so when do you, so what else are you gonna start banning? What is fake news? Because I'll tell you the biggest fake news story of my lifetime was Iraq possessions, possesses weapons of mass destruction. That was the biggest fake news propaganda story in the history of my life. Should the Washington Post be deplatformed then because they posted fake news? You know, we just did a start. We just did a story a few weeks ago on the Jimmy Dore show. Facebook took down a newspaper's Facebook page because the newspaper for the 4th of July posted the Declaration of Independence and they took it down because of hate speech inside the Declaration of Independence. That's a fact that happened. 
and they had only posted the first half of the Declaration of Independence, and their Facebook page got a strike or temporary ban, and then they were afraid to post the second half because it might happen again. So that's the world we're living in right now. The antidote to bad speech is not suppression of that speech. The antidote to bad speech is more speech. That's been debunked, Jimmy. So I just want to <laughs> let everybody know that I'm sure Tucker didn't know, but I did defend you and I defended the I defended free speech and the First Amendment. And to the point where I got into screaming matches on air with the executives at the Young Turks over this. And I couldn't, my mind was blown that they were, they were cheering on your censorship. So what was their take that was like, no, it, their it's take good. was that you all, well, you can't post pornography, so they should be able to. And I'm like, that is not what's going on here. And well, by the way, Jimmy, if I can respond to that, yeah, that's a great point. You notice I didn't, we didn't talk before this interview. No, this is unscripted. I, I, I remembered, so I didn't even know you were going to play that. Clip, I didn't know out of the gates. That's the first thing I brought up was I, I appreciate that you were one of the few people up front that saw what was happening. They were exaggerating what I said out of context, demonizing me so that everybody else would accept me being taken off air. So they then had the prototype to get everybody else taken off air. And it later came out in government documents in the Wall Street Journal that indeed they chose me as a colorful, flamboyant person to get the public to accept that as basically training wheels. Uh, to get everybody on board. But but you hit the nail on the head. I've never killed anybody. Madeleine Albright tripled the sanctions on Iraq as if it wasn't bad enough what George Herbert Walker Bush did and killed several million people. She was in the middle of office as Secretary of State and she gets asked by 60 Minutes, Leslie Stahl, a million people have died, half a million are children. Is that a good price to pay for what you did? She said, yeah, it's a good price to pay. We're proud of it. You know, basically we do it again. Okay, she's lauded and worshipped. And, and then they knew they were lying about WMDs. And, and you get Colin Powell up there with the anthrax and all of that garbage they knew wasn't true. And so they've killed millions of people. But then I am set up in civilization and society as the worst person who's ever existed because I agree with a couple callers calling in once saying, yeah, probably is fake. And they literally cobble that together, have a PR firm, I wasn't the platform for that. They, they needed something afterwards because it made me a martyr, what you predicted. So they dredged up this earlier stuff, exaggerated it times 100, then defaulted me in court cases when I gave them all the stuff. There was no case. The judges found me guilty and then told juries that I was worth $400 million when I was actually broken upside down last year. And now it's finally come out in court and my bankruptcy that I was upside down when the judge says, you're not broke, you're a liar, and your lawyers can't put on any evidence, we're going to have a financial expert who hadn't even reviewed my documents get up on the stand and tell the jury I'm worth $400 million. I mean, th and now Trump has a judge over his trial, his civil trial in New York. This is what they're doing. And if even if you hate Alex Jones or hate the distilled clips people have seen, you know, that's really a straw man, fine, I'm the devil. We, when you take my speech, just like old-fashioned liberals we're smart. They said, let the idiot KKK march. We hate them. They're horrible. But if we take these scumbags' rights, everybody else's is gone, and our rights are too valuable. So, Jimmy, you're an old-fashioned liberal. And I would say Tucker Carlson's an old-fashioned liberal. I know him well. We're friends. We go hunting. You know, I've, known, I've known him well for 10 years. You're around Tucker. He is a real old-fashioned liberal. He's anti-war. He's pro-free He's pro -free speech. He's for populist. He's against the big corporations. He's for monopoly busting, just like you. And that's why I got arrested for protesting George W. Bush. I was against those wars. I was against the Patriot Act. I don't even really call myself a conservative. I'm a populist, pro-human American, and that's why they feared me and misrepresented what I actually said and what I did. And so tell me the misrepresentation of what they of, uh, of your positions that got you banned. When I was able to co-host a show for two and a half hours a couple of weeks ago with Elon Musk on Spaces, that just the main show had 20 million views, over 100 million views of the clips, biggest Spaces uh, that, that that Elon's ever done. And I, I, I hear we're going to do another one soon. He he was told by Tucker privately and others, hey, Alex was not deplatformed for Sandy Hook. He thought that. And he said on the air, he goes, no, I went to the log and I noticed it was for confronting Oliver Darcy who had been taking my sponsors and getting me kicked off things and bragging about it. So I saw him in D.C. going in a committee hearing that they were talking about me at later. 
And I confronted him and said, man, you're an anti-American person. Well, they called that bullying, and that was the final strike uh, that took me off of uh, Twitter at the time. And so then it only made me bigger for a while. And so we they now bragged about it once they won these court cases by rigging them. <laughs> a PR firm put out press releases um, when they won the Connecticut case, the second one in uh, November of last year, 2022. That'd be two years ago or you know, two years back. And I didn't know what happened until later. So, yeah, Sandy Hook happens. It's real. I think it happened. It's a terrible tragedy. School shootings you know, are, are, are real. A bunch of academics and people start looking at anomalies. It becomes this huge Internet thing, hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. Other people covering it, the professors in Florida and Wisconsin and a school safety guy and a bunch of people. And it turned out some of the things they said were true. Some weren't. Turns out a couple of them are probably schizophrenic. And I simply covered it on a few shows. Um had callers call in. What they put in evidence was 22 minutes uh, over six years. It was six years after it, seven years after it, they sued me. I hadn't talked about it when they sued me for over two years. Barely ever talked about it, but they cherry-picked it. The PR firm put the clips out, ran it right, right as I was being deplatformed, right after I was deplatformed in 2018. Suddenly, it's like they were invading a country. The propaganda was in Sometimes every newspaper, almost every day, mm. Nightline, or, or that's already gone, PBS, CNN, every show. Uh, Ted Koppel did chime in on other shows, but it wasn't Nightline. Dan Rather, uh, all of them come out against me. I mean, Old Guard, they had 60-minute shows about it. They had NBC Dateline shows about it. And they said he's currently going to their houses. He's currently sending people to their houses. He's currently urinating on graves. None of that ever was put in court. No one ever did any of that anyways. And so then they sue me for years to get all these depositions. We give them all the discovery. There's nothing there. And they go, you didn't give us everything. You're defaulted. So now we're going to have a trial on damages, but you're already guilty. And then the judges in both places wouldn't let us. They had my phone because we gave them the phones. When they go, oh, we have to, he, he actually gave us his phone. No, no, no. We'd given them all my phones. The, the real reason the lawyers got sanctioned is with the phones, they accidentally just gave them all raw, and they gave them some of the Sandy Hook medical records from those depositions. So the lawyers did mess up, but they already had the phones. So I'd given them all the phones. How am I not giving them all my text messages, all my emails are getting defaulted, and then they have from my lawyers a whole phone? Okay? and And so... This is the type of crap in the Perry Mason moment. They go, we got you. We got your phone and you didn't give us the stuff. And I went, you got my phone because I gave it to my lawyers. And they're like, well, you gave us the raw phone, you son of a bitch. So I'm like, yeah, my lawyers messed up and did that. I had nothing to hide. I'm like, here's my three phones in the last seven years. I kept them, take all the things off. And the best they got was my wife taking a dick pic of me that I never, I'm like, I never took a dick pic. And I'm like, Look at the, I go, oh my God, my wife goes, remember that time you were asleep? I took a picture. And so they have a picture of my ding dong. So <laughs> that's, that's the type of weirdness uh, that, that goes on. Then the PR firms after they won came out and said, and they got bought by the biggest PR, P, P, PR firm in the country right after that, that they were already big out of New York. Who were they? And they, I forget the exact name. If you want, I'll Google it. It's not the it ones that try to do Rogan, is it? The scumbag Midas touched Meisel's brothers. That's the ones who got that thing going at Rogan, uh, the big N-word Spotify controversy because he mentioned Ivermectin. That's those well, guys. Yeah, I don't want to get into inside baseball because uh, Joe's asked me not to, but let's just say you're you're hot. You're, 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 you're <laughs> I'm just curious because I bet there's a couple well, of them. It was a whole bunch yeah. of them. It was a whole bunch. I mean, I could search engine it. It has a particular name. It, 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 they put out press releases when they, quote, won the case saying, hey, we brought his evil to the attention of the public in 2018. Then we got him sued, and now we're going to shut him down. So what they did is they went and cobbled together some stuff, blew it all up, exaggerated it times 100, and, and, and then, I mean, I had people in the grocery store going, listen, you son of a bitch, you stop going to their houses. This is even like a year ago, and I'm like, I never went to their houses. I've never been to Connecticut. I've now since been there at the court case. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't, no one ever went to their houses. No one peed on, there's no proof. They just get up on the stand. Listen to this. There was an FBI agent. I never said his name. Look this up. It was, it, was, it, it, was, it was in court. They admitted it. Never said his name. No one ever covered it on my network at InfoWars. Didn't know who he was. The internet saw him with his gun pointing up the wrong direction. 
uh, with a, no FBI uh, stuff on when he went in, and he is an FBI agent. And he sued me saying because a few people called his office to see if he was real, that was his testimony, he got $95 million. I never said his name, didn't know who he was till he sued me. And then my lawyer goes, has Mr. Jones ever said your name? No. Well, what happened to you? And he goes, well, I had to take six hours of psychological stuff because one time a man called me at the office to see if I was really an FBI agent. $95 million. I mean, that is in the trial where I couldn't respond. And the judge gave us over 30 things I couldn't say. Couldn't say I was in bankruptcy. Couldn't <laughs> say that I uh, only talked about it in 22 minutes in all those years. Never could tell people I'd apologized before they ever sued me because I'm like, I'm not the Sandy Hook guy. I apologize. I apologize. I think it happened. I was just playing devil's advocate. It's... And both judges in Connecticut and Texas literally had the same list I couldn't say. And that's why when I did say, I'm in bankruptcy, she goes, shut it down, get the jury out, get off the stand, go sit down. And she goes, Mr. Jones, you're a liar. You're not bankrupt. You're not broke. And she goes, now, financial expert, and we could not respond, got up for a full day and said, this man, I've examined his books, never examined our books, is worth $400 million. I was millions in the hole then. Okay, millions in the hole then. And I'm like, here's my filed bankruptcy. The judge said, you're not entering that. And, and, and so again, whether you think I'm good or bad, folks, they murdered justice in a, in, in a PR run operation. And then, I'm not supposed to get into this, but you were really, you weren't warm. You were white hot with what you said. <laughs> they then got the text messages and imagine whose text messages are on there. Innocuous stuff like, hey, let's get a steak. Hey, what's going on? Hey, man, come to the club tonight. And then there was a behind-the-scenes harassment operation that went on against somebody. So so this is dragnet. Just attack. Go after whoever you can. It's unbelievable. It's what they do to espionage, like people for espionage. Yeah. So, and, and you know. The well, I'm ranting on that, but let me just throw this bookmark in and then I'll shut up, Jimmy. I, I knew this when Obama left office in the, in the John Warren Defense Authorization Act 2017, his last act. Major Act was to sign the defense authorization. He got $2 billion in there to set up the Office of Countering Foreign Disinformation Propaganda Act, which then started that Trump's a Russian agent, and yeah. now we can spy on his whole operation, and we can get General Flynn because he's a communist. And then now they admit with the weaponization hearings, off of that wheel, at the middle of that wheel, they built the spokes of the censorship, the surveillance, the FBI, the CIA— coordinating all the censorship. That's all admitted. I knew that. I This would get no news coverage. I remember, right when I was deplatformed four years ago, watching the House Armed Services Committee meeting where they had the Pentagon experts saying, Mr. Jones is a Russian disinformation agent. We're tracking him, and we're now working with big tech and AI to block his Russian influence. I have the clip. So what I'm saying is it, what, exactly what your co-host just said is that is what I was, and, and that, and we know a three-letter agency used law firms, the top Democrat law firms in the country ran this, law firms, PR firms, but it was the Justice Department. Listen to this, in my bankruptcy, and they were done up to send an email. This is a year ago. The Justice Department sent an email to my famous bankruptcy lawyer here, well-known, super respected, done some of the biggest bankruptcies in the country for like chemical giants and says, Mr. Jones will not be afforded the bankruptcy system. This is a hurdle he will not get across. And then the Justice Department came into the case, and when I'm in these depositions, they have one to two federal agents in the room hoping to find something. And I've been so transparent, so real, all the bookkeeping checked out, everything was true. Remember all the headlines? Alex Jones, he's got secret accounts. Alex Jones has offshore accounts. Alex Jones has hundreds of millions of dollars. You can go to Bloomberg. I was actually covering it today. You can go to the Connecticut News. Alex Jones is broke, sold his car and his guns and his you know, basically wife's jewelry. I am three million in the hole right now. You can read them. Here's the headline. Alex Jones is broke and selling his stuff. Here's how he got there. Uh, Bloomberg. Alex Jones gets green light to sell his guns and cars. Bloomberg, they now admit that I'm three million in the hole. I was, I was, so, so again, I have I, under penalty of perjury all this. So now they flipped from, oh, we were wrong. He didn't hide $400 million to, oh, sorry. Oh, they also sued my dad, my mom, my family. My what? dad spent his whole savings, who was a dentist for 
50, 49 years. My dad has no money, can't even pay his property taxes. My dad spent a million and a half dollars in the last couple of years. They think it's funny. They think it's funny claiming my dad had hidden money. I, I know I'm ranting. I'm going to shut up now. So, and the, and the reason why, so I had said that, well, first they come for Alex Jones and then they're going to come for us. If you're doing independent news and you're speaking against the wars, they're going to come for us. And so that's why you have to stand up right now. And of course, nobody at the Young Turks will ever go against the wars. They're always for the wars. They're always for whatever the establishment wants, whether it's smearing Julian Assange or pushing Russiagate hoax or COVID lockdowns and to, and demeaning ivermectin and lying about that. They're all for all of it. So that's why they didn't care that you got banned because they're never ever going to go against the establishment. Well, they're given talking points. Nobody, I can tell, nobody gives you talking points. Nobody gives me talking points. And that's why they don't like us is because that's why they don't like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan says exactly what he really thinks. And they don't like authenticity, but the people like it. So yeah, you were big back at the time you defended me. You were big. You're gigantic now. So it's kind of fair what Tucker said is no huge show defended Jones. No okay. show he heard of. So and so what it went from you and then it immediately went to journalists and then it went to leading journalists. Then it went to the leading doctors and scientists in their field. And then it went to the former president of the United States. They banned everybody. So it wasn't just Alex Jones. They they banned anybody and everybody, including anybody who had any counter narrative to the establishment narrative around war, around COVID, around lockdowns, around January 6th, around anything. Anybody who had anything to say that the CIA, the FBI, and the establishment didn't want them to say, they banned, they censored, and they discredited. And I've I've been I've uh, I've firsthand have now of that you know what the one of the first bullshit testing on who we can like do this do was uh gamergate there's people that work in real journalism that to this day still bring that up like that was a real thing and it was the exact same kind of bullshit i had the whole media do it to me for a week mm -hmm. charlie rose i'll never forget that tweet nammy then he got me too later that piece of shit yeah. hilarious yeah. So so do you think the reason why they went after you so hard and they and and had to take you down, they had to do all this nefarious stuff, twist your words to, to take you down was so that they could set a precedent so they knew what was coming, so they knew that they were going to want to censor uh, anybody and everybody. And so they had to have somebody to start with. And that's what that was. I, I actually know this, and I always forget the name of the article because I don't usually subscribe to stuff, but I had to get behind a paywall to find it. About six months before I got deplatformed in August of 2018, when Tim Cook literally held a powwow meeting, he admitted and decided to curate me, and they wouldn't even say why. And then they gave some fake reasons later, not Sandy Hook. Um, I remember six months before that, I don't remember the exact Wall Street Journal headline, but there was another article about it called, Hold on to your tinfoil hat, Alex Jones. I think it was like Gizmodo. Hold on to your tinfoil hat, Alex Whoa. Jones. You're about to be... You're about to be taken off the air. And then it was a synopsis of the Wall Street Journal. This Wall Street Journal article was one of those articles for the corporate elite. And so it was like 25 pages long. I go subscribe to it. And I forget the exact headline. And it, and it was NATO meeting with the tech heads in Europe wow. and meeting with News, with, with, with News Corp. And they said in the article, uh, don't worry when News Corp splits and sells its entertainment uh, division. We're still going to be popular. So this was to the shareholders of, of, of News Corp through the Wall Street Journal that they actually also own on, on the news division when it split. And I'm, so I'm reading this 20-something page article, and it says, soon the internet will be like cable TV. I think they use Netflix as an example. You'll have a thousand channels maybe, but that'll be it. We're not going to let people go to all these old sites and alternative sites. And we're going to do it by going after Assange when the left doesn't stand up for him and the journalists don't. We'll have the left. Then we're going to we're going to we're demonizing Alex Jones. He's a horrible person. When we then take him off the air, and the right wing doesn't stand up because they don't want to be next. Then when we take off the next person, the next person, the next person, it's, it's human nature. No one will stand up, and we'll take them all, liberals and conservatives. And it's I've got to find that article again. But it was a twenty-something page battle diagram. So I go on air with it, and I say I'm about to be taken off because that was a. High-level article, not for pop culture, but for real business people to invest in News Corp when they split their, their entertainment division. And they explained, we're going to end freedom on the internet, and we're going to use this punk to do it. So I, it wasn't that I was that important. 
They, I was big, sure. And I was populist and they fear that. And I was uncontrolled. But they chose me because I did do clownish stuff a lot. And I, and I still do. I have fun. I'm on the air four hours a day. And so I, I was just chosen as patient zero along with Julian Assange. It was me and Julian is, is who was in the article. And it's very cold-blooded. So, yes, they admit that I was the first domino. And the, the feds tried to take your cat, right? Were you able to keep them? Uh, it, it's actually true. Um, my my uh, wife, the cat's like four years old now. Uh, we got for my now six-year-old daughter, she wanted a cat. The other cat we loved so much had, had snuck out of the house and got down the street and got run over. And so uh, we heard that ragdoll cats were really great. Other Joe Rogan stories, this is the best cats ever, super smart. So I get a ragdoll, and folks, they are amazing. Uh, it's like it's like a dog. It's super smart. We go on walks on the golf course at Policis. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's amazing. Listen, one day I walk in when the cat's a year old, and it's on the toilet pissing. Swear, didn't teach it out. It just saw us doing it. Swear to God, strike me down. It's not true. And so, so my point is, I'm in a deposition with the U.S. Justice Department and like six lawyers, no, seven lawyers deposing me in the conference room. They came here. In a conference room right through those doors, and they look at me, and 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 the federal the federal justice department says, Mr. Jones, how much did your cat cost? And I said, I think it cost two thousand dollars. And they said, All right, well, we're gonna put that on there as an asset, you're gonna have to give up. And I said, Is that a joke? And they said, No, we're we're serious. Uh, and but they're gonna give me an opportunity. My bankruptcy's almost over, I'm selling everything right now, which I don't even care about, including this watch soon. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna have to have my dad or somebody. Uh, buy the cat for me. So no, they they are trying to take the cat. Wow, kind of kind of unbelievable. Uh, I, I mean, I know that doesn't sound real. Sounds real the, to me. Uh, I think the <laughs> the pigs. The news. The news called them and they admitted it. They think that's great. Like they think, like, yeah, his whole life. It, it's it's like uh, cancel pigs, but but you know, with the real full force of the U.S. government behind them. By the way, the Willie Nelson story is true too. Well, tell, tell me, tell me my, about he, that. Okay. I used to know Willie really well. He used to go to his house and play chess with him outside Austin. And because he was real anti-war and he, and he, and he you know, he, he hated George Bush. And he saw my movies about the war. And so he came to one of my movie showings one time. And so for about two years, I, I hung out with him probably 10, 15 times. I mean, I, and, and a few years, about 10 years ago, I, I went to dinner with him once, but he's kind of, he, even then his brain was you know, not all, not hundred percent what he used to be. But I knew him when he was 74, 75. He even invited me out to Maui and stuff. I never went. But but the point was, we got to be decent friends. And I'd go out to his house and hang out at luck with him. And I'd smoke a lot of pot with him. I'm not a big pot guy, but you smoke pot with Willie. And he has those those vaporizer volcanoes back before most people heard of them. This is like, you know, in like 2000, 2007 you know, and eight and stuff. And we would smoke pot till I couldn't walk and <laughs> playing chess. And, and he would just keep, and he would suck on it. And keep saying one more, and he would just keep going. I mean, when he says "roll me up and smoke me," but the point was, when Willie Nelson hands you that thing, it's dripping with spit. And I'm like, I'm not gonna wipe this off. It's kind of cool. I'm not gay, but I, I was like, it's Willie Nelson. I, so, so it's just funny. I always make that joke to family and stuff that I had Willie Nelson spit in my mouth. And then, and I was, I was telling the story just the other day to family and some friends, and I go, wait a minute, Jimmy Dore spit into my mouth. Because if you watch the video, I'm like, oh, no, yeah, and all of a sudden he goes, Meh. and I remember like, I was like, is that iced tea or Coke? I actually, I got so much of it in my mouth. Just a funny story. It, it was called, it was actually called Honest Tea. That's the irony there. <laughs> so, Anyways, I'm just fired up to be on and to actually get out of the Matrix because I, I am like in phantom zone on my own show weekdays. I'm on some radio stations. A lot of folks come to Infowars.com, but other than that, they could. The worst part about being canceled and, and being uh, deplatformed is they can now build this fake person however they want, and so they don't just silence you. That'd be okay. You like go away, like Obi Wan Kenobi. No, they then build this person you're not, and so oh, it gets worse. They'd run headlines: Alex Jones sends child porn to Sandy Hook families, and I couldn't go on Twitter. I couldn't go on Facebook and say that's not true. They subpoenaed 9 million emails. They said, no, it's not enough. We want all, and we were dumb enough, because why are we even storing it, to have 15 years of emails on this email system. And we said, screw it. My lawyer said, nothing to hide. We searched it. None of me scheming against them. None of me talking about them. 
I had crazy send me emails about Sandy Hook, which they later put in the court. Look what this lady sent you. Doesn't that sound bad? Oh, that's the proof I'm bad. And someone who was attacking me for questioning Sandy Hook sent me emails with embedded invisible links to child porn. They just happened to scan uh. the millions of emails and find the, 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 the hidden links. So we got a letter from the FBI in days saying Mr. Jones is the victim of this. They were actually nice and did that. And Jones is not a suspect. He, these were unopened emails because they give it to the FBI. These are unopened emails that he never opened. He's the victim of someone sending it to him. It's like swatting somebody, but you know, yeah, right. a, a, another form of so so so. But oh, the headlines didn't say that. The headlines said Alex Jones sends child porn. Really? Why am I not in jail? So again, that tells you about these PR firms. Yeah, it's like you're running for office, but just to live your life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So let me just ask you just a general question. Uh, how much of our reality do you think is manipulated by elites or intelligence tricks? It depends on the person. Some people are completely, some people are totally oblivious, oblivious and pay attention to nothing except for sports or sitcoms or whatever it is they're into. Other people are political, both right wing and left wing, and think they know what's going on. And they're established for right wing, they're in a facsimile of disinformation. They're establishment left wing. They're really in a uh, hologram. And then you've got just normal populist informed people from blue collar workers up to academics uh, that just really get the fact that the public trust has been broken. The mainstream media lies on purpose. Uh, they're very nasty. They're trying to divide the country for social control. That was in the WikiLeaks emails from a head psychologist of a psychology department. I think it was Columbia, but I forget the exact one. And this is certified real WikiLeak. And he, and he says, we're losing because people aren't paying attention to us. It's not that they hate us or even agree with us or disagree. It's that they don't even care about us anymore. So we're going to have to go to culture war. And this is in 2016 in the middle of the election. So, right. so, so they're using, you know, that they legalized back in 2000 and 2010. Obama, remember? Smith uh, Modernization Act. Legalized propaganda, exactly. You guys have covered that a lot. I've seen you do that. And so th that's the CIA. So they always planted stories overseas that came back on purpose. And they had Operation Mockingbird that came out in the Frank Church Committees in, in, in the 70s, late 70s. But but this is directly the CIA going after you. And look, I can speak to the CIA. People always go, oh, he admits he's an agent. He admits he's bad. No, I had uh, my late uncle was high level. Uh, in Army Special Operations and like running stuff in, in uh, major operations in Iran-Contra. And I had a other family that was involved uh, in back when Humet was really big before it was all digital. And, and so growing up, I had family talking trash about the government, how they're lying, how they're full of crap, how both parties are bad, how it's all big corporations, about all they did. And then this is me listening around the corner to family where both people – you know, or have been in, in you know in this, and I'm and like, yeah, that son of a bitch. All we did is go around paying off the mafia and then cracking heads. And they didn't follow our orders, and yeah, those bastards are smuggling kids out of Guatemala. They ought to all be shot. And 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 like, I'm sitting there around the corner. Uh, I mean, this was both sides of my family, by the way. Had people that were in this. And that sounds like, ooh, it's mysterious. No, it's like working at Walmart before the mid '90s when signals intelligence and digital spying on the NSA really got to where it could grab every call and every email. It was 90% humet, 10% signals. They phased that all out in the mid '90s, but before that, the CIA didn't just have its regular budget. It was you know dealing cocaine to have a It was everywhere. It's, it's it's like saying, oh, I had family work for Coca Cola, except it's a <laughs> government criminal mafia. And they recruit the best in their classes, patriotic. You know, they had programs in the 60s. Oh, you want to be part of NASA in the early 60s? And, and kids would go who were top of their class. A recruiter would come into the school and, and say, oh, you, you know, you're top of your class. And I see you, you know, do all this and you can shoot really good. And you filled out this survey for NASA that you, you know, you camp out sometimes for a week by yourself when you were like 12 years old. And, you know, you've done all this stuff. We want you to join NASA. And we want you to come to the University of Texas when you're 15 next year, and we want to put you in a program. That happened to one of my family, very close to me. And by the time he was about 19, he figured it out, 
and was like, whoa, I'm not doing this. Okay, so I mean, but, but, but I mean, you couldn't shake a stick, swing a stick in the dark, you know, in, in Texas at that time and not hit these people. And, and so, I mean, I've had, I've had growing up, you know, uh, 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 oh, uh, you know, a, a German, uh, East German at the house for three months who's being trained how to do something. I mean, so I'm, I'm telling you, that's how close I am to this. I know all about this stuff. So, okay. Um, let me just get your take on the Ukraine war because the American people have no idea what actually the Ukraine war is about. They have no idea that there was a coup that the CIA instigated with the help of the Nazis inside Ukraine. Uh, they don't know that there were two peace agreements that Ukraine violated, not Russia. And they think that one day oh, Vladimir Putin just woke up and got a bug up his ass and decided to invade Ukraine. And that's his first step into invading the rest of Europe, which <laughs> it just seems mental. And because it is. And so I wanted this. This recently came out. Um, uh, Ukraine ambassador Chalyi, who participated in peace talks with Russia in the spring of 2022, because there was a peace agreement. As soon as this war started, there was immediately a peace agreement. And remember, Boris Johnson was flown at the behest of NATO to talk to Zelensky to squash it. Well, here this uh, 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 ambassador is going to talk about that very thing. Here it is. I was in that moment in the group of Ukrainian negotiators. We negotiate uh, with Russian delegation practically two months, in March and April, the possible peaceful settlement agreement with, between Ukraine and Russia. And we, as you remember, concluded so-called Istanbul communique. And we were very close in the middle of April, in the end of April, to finalize our war with some peaceful settlement. For some reasons, it was postponed. But to my mind, Putin, this is my personal view, Putin in one week after started his aggression in 24 February last year, very quickly understood he did mistake and tried to do everything possible to conclude agreement with Ukraine. And Istanbul communique, it was his personal decision to accept the text of this communique, which totally far away from the initial proposal of Russia, ultimatum proposal of Russia, which they put before the Ukrainian delegation in Minsk. So we managed to find a very real compromise. So Putin really wanted to reach some peaceful settlement with Ukraine. It's very important to remember. So there it was. There it's, that's an ambassador who was part of the negotiations in April of 2022. They had an agreement, a compromise with Putin. He's saying Putin really wanted to have peace. He really wanted to end the war. And of course, that all got squashed. Now, Putin has talked about this and we've covered this. Uh, and it all got squashed because the United States and the UK, meaning NATO, didn't want it. And so they had Boris Johnson go to Ukraine and and tell Zelensky, you better not do this. Plus, he also had the Nazis saying, if you in Ukraine, if you do it, we're going to hang you from a, a tree and uh, which they probably would have. So he didn't do it. So he squashed the peace agreement. So, again, the aggressors are the United States, NATO. Uh, the warmongers is the military industrial complex. And it's not it, they have to make Putin out to be this caricature of a thug. Even though, meanwhile, we're we're occupying a country right next door called Syria, a third of that country, and which third do you think we're occupying? The part with the oil. So, what do you what do you say to, to this? What do you what what have you told your your viewers about Ukraine? Well, I've told them the exact same thing you've said because it's the truth. If you go back to nine years ago, the Victoria Newland got caught on a release tape. She didn't deny it. Yeah. The ambassador to the EU saying. Screw the EU, screw what they want. We're going to basically start, you know, a war. And, and then seven years ago, a few years after that overthrow and that coup where they attacked the government, killed all the police and, you know, burned down buildings and installed their new leader that was, you know, more anti-Russia. They then had a, a CNN report with Fareed Zarkaria where George Soros went on there and bragged that he got $5 billion from the State Department and had done the coup a few years before and then U.S. troops and advisors began to come into the country and, 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 and train the Ukrainian death squads. 
because uh, you know the country split between Slavic and kind of Germanic groups, and that was a split in World War II. But it's still it's where Russia was founded a thousand years ago, and is mainly Slavic. But Europe's been pushing the, you know, the Russians for hundreds of years, basically back towards the Russian border, and so they began to attack those ninety nine percent Russian areas. And, and Putin kept saying, "Stop doing it! Stop doing it! Stop doing it!" And he said, "If you try to bring them into NATO, I'm going to take." Crimea, which he then did a few years later. And he said, I'm going to take the Donbass regions and Donetsk and some of those other areas uh, there on the western border of Russia as a security zone. And, and so it was a provocation by NATO. I'm not defending Russia. I'm not a Russia file, but I have studied the history of it. And then I knew, that's how I was able to predict, in October, two years ago, plus, uh, before the Russians went in, in February, that there would be a war in that area that Putin would go in by February if he was going to, because that was the intel I got from people I know in the military whose sons were over there already training the Ukrainians and they knew it was coming. And so when the Russians lied and said, we're not going to invade a few weeks before, and the Reuters reporter confronted uh, the State Department CIA guy and, and said, you're Alex Jones now, claiming the Russians are you know, going to do a false flag and invade or whatever. Uh, but I was saying, no, no, the Russians are going to go in. And they don't want people to know because NATO's moving weapons up against their border. And if, if, if Ukraine joins NATO, they've said they're going to put nuclear weapons uh, there. Yes. And, and, and so this is a major escalation. People don't know in the Cuban Missile Crisis that Kennedy put uh, medium-range Hercules uh, missiles. In Turkey. Uh, and uh, what was the other missile? The Hawk missiles with nukes in Turkey. And so that's when the Russians right. then put nukes in 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 uh, in uh, Cuba. Cuba. That's why and they don't so, take the point about that with Ukraine because we've provoked it before and thought we should be allowed to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 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 Russia. Putin's told the truth. By the way, you talk about this ambassador saying that that you just mentioned. You just played. Putin at the time said, "I only want a security zone, and I only want to make you sue for peace." And, and he was never planning to take the capital. He did that to pin down their forces while he secured those areas. And so he said, I want a peace deal. He gave speeches at the time saying, this can end right now. Say you're not going to enter NATO and say you're not going to attack uh, these eastern areas and I'll completely pull out. But he said, if you don't pull out, I will take as much of Ukraine as we have to to secure our border. Because remember, 90% of the Russians live in Western Russia. And, and Putin said, we don't need more land. We're the biggest country in the world. We have more resources than even Africa. It's like three USAs can fit into Russia. He said, we don't want to expand. We want to stabilize. We want a peace economy. He cut defense spending until this war started for the last decade. So he's not in an offensive position. The globalists controlling America are in an offensive position. And that's it has to end. Now they're going to conscript women. Now uh, the, yeah. the, the, the former head of uh, U.S. forces in Europe last week just called for them to conscript women. Zelensky's calling up 500,000 uh, people, and they know they've already lost. So it's purely a political diversion and a money laundering operation, and it is pure war profiteering, and it's most sick and most evil. I Yeah, it, it's just amazing to me how well the propaganda works. Uh, it like we learn nothing from the Iraq War. I mean, as a, as, a, as a general people, we learn nothing from the Iraq War. We learn nothing from twenty years of lies and and the Afghanistan paper that showed that Afghanistan papers that showed Afghan was a twenty year lie. That we did learn nothing from Libya turning the most successful country in Africa and turning into a failed state with open Vietnam. slave markets. We learn nothing from Vietnam. We learn nothing from Syria and the lies about gas attacks. We learn nothing from Yemen. Nothing. We've learned nothing. And they can they can just pull off this Ukraine, and then you get these Rachel Maddows and Sean Hannitys and Anderson Coopers to go on and just lie about the war. And you know they're lying because I know the truth. And who am I? I'm a comedian, and so I know the truth about it. I know they have to know about it because they have million dollar staffs. I don't have that. And, and now, and now they're not they're not just picking fights with third world Muslim countries right. so they can just pump trillions in. You know, like Afghanistan and, and steal it. No, ladies and gentlemen, and I, and I know the Afghans aren't Arab, but I'm talking about the Arabs, Middle East, and also the the, the uh, Pashtuns and the Afghans over there in Central Asia. Now they're picking fights with the largest nuclear power in the world that lost a third of its population fighting Hitler. So just like Napoleon went to destroy his empire, 
The American empire is going back to Russia to die. I love America. I'm a loyal American. Putin isn't censoring me. Putin isn't stealing elections. Putin isn't taking my political front-runner candidates off the ballot. Putin isn't dissolving my borders and telling people to come up here for free stuff. Putin isn't shipping in uh, fentanyl to kill 100,000 people a year. Uh, he, no, no, he's not doing any of that. And it's all our hijacked, crazy, out-of-control government that's run out of people to start fights with. So now they're starting fights with the biggest nuclear power in the world. Somebody needs to take the keys away from these maniacs. So... Uh, speaking about, you know, how how Americans are just they're the most propaganda. I say Americans are the most propagandized people in the world and they don't know it. Right. At least in the old Soviet Union, when somebody saw something on the news or read it in the paper, they knew it was probably propaganda. Uh, same thing in China. But in America, people literally think that Lawrence O'Donnell and Jake Tapper and and Laura Ingram are telling you the truth. It's just mind blowing to me. I go. I just went to a couple of Christmas parties, and it was like watching a, a wind up cartoon doll of people just repeat propaganda back to me. Whether it was about Fauci, whether I I was talking to a guy. He just got his booster last week. He just got his booster. Well, he has eight. He, he has all eight. I, I'm guessing he does. I don't know anybody who catches them all. Okay. <laughs> anyway, and so. That that's is and so just to to speak to this now people turn now I used to be a big fan of Bill Mars and yeah. so Bill Maher recently said that now it's been clear to me since I started doing this show that Bill Maher is ignorant on purpose right it, either either he's mind controlled or he's ignorant on purpose uh, because uh, it's just so obvious again if I have access to this information a guy who works at HBO with a million dollar staff. He also has access to this information, and he's either mind controlled or so. Listen, to what Roseanne asked him this question. This is very interesting. Sure. No wonder I don't remember this. No shit, you blocked it out, MK Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> who's that? Bill Maher doesn't know who. M who's that? <laughs> and I don't think that's a joke. I think he's. Do you do you mean Martin Luther King Ultra? Is is that what he thinks? It's it's unbelievable. Can you believe he pretends not to know what MK Ultra is, or do you think he really doesn't know, or do you think he's actually a victim of it? I I think Bill Maher is lying there. He also said he doesn't know who Klaus Schwab is. I think in the same interview. Yes, here, here, here let me right. let me play that. it. Here it is. That's the mind control program you're under, Bill. <laughs> yeah. So who's but who's Klaus Schwab? The head of the WEF. What's that? This is uh, this is mind blowing to me. He doesn't know who the people are. He doesn't know he what did MK. Yuval Harari on so the this, Igor of Klaus Schwab. So not long ago, Bill had on someone named Bella Thorne on his podcast, and she uh, was offended uh, because he mocked her pronouns. So who the fuck is Bella Thorne? She's a 26-year-old actress who, unlike Klaus Schwab, the WEF, MK Ultra, that's someone who Bill actually has heard of. So he's heard of some no-name actress nobody's ever heard of, but he's never heard of MK Ultra, WEF, or Klaus Schwab. Boy, he is the smartest guy in the room, as long as this the room is filled with dumb shit libs. Am I right? <laughs> Well, well, that's right. And now he's trying to act like he's more populist because he knows people are waking up. Look, he's not stupid. We know Leonardo DiCaprio and hundreds of movie stars get paid to go to the WEF, fly, flown on private jets. I bet a lot of money, I don't know this for a fact, that he's been invited to the World Economic Forum. It's all over the news. It's massive coverage during their events. Uh, and, and I mean, people knew it was 20 years ago. They certainly knew 10 years ago. And then in the last three, four the liberty movement, the, the, the populist movement, has it, it trends on you know Twitter every week. It's all over the place. So I don't believe that he doesn't know what MK Ultra is. I mean, even History Channel and Discovery Channel have had hundreds of programs, literally since it's been on for forty years, thirty-five years. I mean, I've I've seen fifty programs. I don't even watch a lot of TV about MK Ultra. It's on PBS. Uh, you know, Doctor Ewing Cameron in Canada. Over ten thousand kids over thirty years taken from foster homes and stuff and electroshocked and given drugs and programmed into new personalities. And uh, they had congressional hearings on it in the 90s and the 2000s and in 1977. And he doesn't know about MK Ultra that Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was in, LA Times. Alexander Cockburn looked that up. So I don't believe, no, he's playing dumb 
because he knows these are the things you don't talk about. I mean, come on. If 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 the WEF and Klaus Schwab were real, I'm sure Bill Maher would have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in by nonsense. The way, by, by the way, Jimmy, th- th- that's the old tactic. Just 10 years ago, they would have New York Times articles saying Alex Jones feverishly was having a schizoid event at, in in Virginia outside a hotel conference center, imagining there were men with sunglasses and helicopters. Meanwhile, the king of Spain's there, the head of the Defense Department, Henry Kissinger, world leaders. They had Marines on top of the building with State Department security, literal black helicopters we got video of. Okay, it's in my film Endgame and others. And then the New York Times reviewed a film I was in called The New World Order and said it did not exist. Now, now, by then, the Bilderberg Group was set up after World War II between what was left of the Nazis and uh, the UK and America to kind of reconstitute Europe and the Marshall Plan. Their own documents have been released by the Congressional Records Office. This is an official group, but they wouldn't cover it, and they would say it wasn't real, even though the Bilderberg Group as of 15 years ago, went public, started putting out press releases about who would be there, but that it's secret, okay? So even five years after they're publicly admitting they exist and putting out where they're going to meet, the New York Times was saying it does not exist. So, yeah, I mean, I always, again, um, when I was... They made it seem like if you talked about the Bilderberg Group, you are some conspiracy crazy tinfoil hat person. There is no mafia, and now, right, there is no <laughs> right. Hey, the first rule of MK Ultra is there is no MK Ultra. Am I right? And so I don't think maybe I don't think uh, Bill Maher is controlled by the CIA. I think he's controlled by another three letter organization. It's called HBO. <laughs> that is what it is. Yeah, he does sound like Hannity when he's asked about Bilderberg. Oh. Sean Hannity, watch him play dumb. Oh, he plays dumb too? Oh, yeah. But now I know. Oh, he always plays dumb. So the Bilderbergs oh, 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 oh. had a meeting in Washington, D.C. It was maybe a year or two ago. And Max Blumenthal from uh, the Gray Zone went and covered it. And that's how I know for sure it's for a real thing. And he documented the people who were there and the people who were coming in and out. Yeah, they meet They meet three years in, in, three years in a row in Europe. And then every fourth year they meet in Chantilly, Virginia at this... Uh, Usually they meet at like five star places. This place is uh, nice. I've stayed there before they got in there. Uh-huh. But it, it's like a four star giant conference center surrounded by defense contractors, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. I mean, literally, it's a conference center with a golf course so they can play golf because they play golf the, 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 the fourth day. Plenty of liquors, I'm sure. Day. And it's surrounded, but something your co host, everything he says is key. Notice he said, the mafia doesn't exist. And that's the parallel I use with this. Yeah. It was until the mid-1950s, Congress and J. Edgar Hoover, who was being blackmailed by the FBI over his cross-dressing that's come out, he would testify to Congress, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, look this up. I'm sure you guys are, know a lot of history, so you know about it, that La Cosa Nostra and the mafia was a myth and that there was not an Italian mafia. Of course, we now know there's a mafias in all groups. And it wasn't until some rogue FBI agents think planted a bug in a farmhouse remember in connecticut i think it was yep and they and they caught like the 15 mob heads like in the godfather in this big palatial farmhouse meeting around this big table carving up the country and then suddenly <laughs> we all know the italians have a mafia I mean, it's the same thing but they don't want us to know there's a global black rock corporate mafia that wants to control the world that cloaks itself in liberalism and wokeism to give them political cover while they drive us into world war three devalue our currencies and uh, just destroy us so speaking of that the the new mafia uh which i you know could, a lot of people uh i'm one of them the new mafia silicon valley the wef uh the military industrial complex well look at this story Mark Zuckerberg says Facebook of the future will be powered by telepathic thoughts. He's Facebook users, and this is according to him, Facebook users in the future will share telepathic thoughts and feelings to each other, Mark Zuckerberg claims. You're going to just be able to capture a thought, what you're thinking or feeling in kind of its ideal and perfect form in your head, and be able to share that with the world in a format they can get that. He called on people to think less in in nations 
but as a citizen of a global community using innovations and technology for progress. This, well, this sounds like <laughs> exactly what every person who was claimed was deemed a conspiracy theorist. Here it is. Here's the head of Silicon Valley, the head of Facebook, Instagram, the billionaire himself, Mark Zuckerberg, saying, hey, don't think of, just like, you know, you remember that movie, um, uh, network where Ned Beatty gave that speech where he says there are no countries, there are only companies in the international transfer of dollars, and you have upset the natural order of the transfer of dollars, and you must atone. That's what this he's saying right there. He's giving the Ned Beatty speech. He's saying there are no countries, there are only companies. You have meddled with the tidal <laughs> forces of nature, Mister Neal, <laughs> and you must atone. You get up there on your little bitty 18-inch screen and you talk about nations and borders and peoples. There are no nations. There are no borders. There are no peoples. There are only... I mean, the, And that's actually the globalist speech. You know, I've actually been in boardrooms similar to that, and those are off-record meetings, when they were trying to get me to join News Corps and, and, and trying to get me 15 years ago to go to Fox and, and, and meetings just like, listen... This is all over. It's a corporate global system, Alex. You'll have more in effect joining us. Come work with us. Henry Kissinger had the head of his Kissinger group one time in front of my producer. Uh, and this wasn't off record, so I've told the story. Say, come to New York. We want you to work for us. You can lead the liberty movement. But that's how you'll have a seat at the table. So <clears throat> they go around and buy people up like they just buy up baseball cards. But, but go back to Zuckerberg. He's literally saying, we're going to read your mind. Facebook's going to read your mind. Well, that's super creepy. Well, how are you going to read our mind? Again, but he also put $24 billion or whatever it was into the metaverse, which was a hellscape. So, But it shows you where they want to take us. They don't want just the Internet of Things. They want us. They want our minds. They want our bodies. You can so, order pizza with your mind. You, you see that in 60 minutes? Yes, you can that order. That idiot, the one guy with the guy is like, did you just order pizza with your mind? Like he couldn't believe. It's the Matrix. It's the Matrix. Yeah. It's the Matrix. You know, you're going to be in a pod. And, and, and they have patents now for beds you lay in, and the heat from your body powers the computers. Wow. Wow, that's that's very Matrix-like. That's unbelievable. You know, originally the Matrix, it wasn't supposed to be batteries because humans are shitty batteries. It was supposed to be they were hooked up as a neural network for the computer, but the dipshit producer said, no one's going to get that. Say they're batteries. Oh, really? And so that I saw that of it being batteries, it was originally something much more, like not too smart, just a good a good thing. That battery thing scientifically doesn't hold up at all because a dumb fuck producer said that. Okay. Yeah. And that's true. And, and, and so let me add a caveat. There is a Wired Magazine article came out about 12 years ago. It was talking about Eric Schmidt and the founding with uh, NQTEL and the CIA and the NSA who already had the search engine system that, where they would grab all the data and emails and internet traffic and phone calls and create uh, word messages, and then if they wanted to search what we were saying, Google was the NSA search engine for a program called Echelon. This is all declassified. And so Google at their first meeting, when the Pentagon signed on, said, we're going to create the first AI, but it's going to be a cybernetic AI where you're a neural network and we're mm -hmm. get millions of people in live time dialed into us, and then we'll be able to send messages back and stimuli to control them as the original inventors of the internet in an ARPA DARPA program in 1960, where a where a uh, Pentagon psychiatrist looked this up, created the intergalactic communication system. It was on paper and said there would be big TVs everywhere that gave you messages. You would carry a handheld computer that would track everything you did, and daily you download it into the system. It was all theoretical, and that they would then use the intergalactic communication system to program humanity. So this is an original theoretical plan that they developed the the, the the theoretic blueprint for in 1960. Look it up. You can't make this up. And that's what Google is today. And it is artificially intelligent because it's a computer interfacing with us and it is AI. But the secret is AI is us. That's why when you see AI yeah. art, it's just throwing what we've done plagiarizing our writing, right. our videos, our photos, our I, our poetry. And we go, this is beautiful because it's narcissistic. We're looking yeah. at ourselves in the pool of water. Representation. That's stupid shit. Yeah. 
I always thought Twitter seemed like a crazy, big, crazy brain when you look at the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, this, how, how do we know Twitter's not already alive? No, no. no that's a secret. Elon, kinds, Musk, yeah. Elon Musk is using it to program his AI Grok. And, 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 and so they took everybody else off the internet because Google's training its system and didn't want anybody like us on there. I've been told this by high-level people, believe it at that. And, and so, yes, a, a Musk actually bought Twitter to promote his stuff and politically be involved, but the real reason is to program his AI. So here's something that's even creepier. So Mar Mark Zuckerberg says that this is going to happen in the future. It's here. Well, here's the WEF. This is important. Telling you that it's already here. So this is a this is about a two two and uh, maybe a three minute video, and watch what they have to say. This is kind of mind blowing. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song, sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen, and notice a now familiar sight that appears whenever you're overloaded with pleasure your theta brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. You mentally move the cursor to the left and scroll through your brain data over the past few hours. You can see your stress levels rising as the deadline to finish your memo approached, causing a peak in your beta brainwave activity right before an alert popped up, telling you to take a brain break. <laughs> your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. You breathe a sigh of relief when the email she sends you later that day congratulates you on your brain <laughs> from the past quarter which have earned you another performance bonus. That's when you part, arrive at true. work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails, text messages, and GPS location data, the government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. Now, they're looking for his co-conspirators you discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, you've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking, you remove your earbuds. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. Yeah. When I saw this, it was six months old. Like at the so, end of Watchmen, we did our plan a half hour ago. Yeah. So it's so it's here, Alex. That, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of this, right? That this video exists and that uh, they uh, uh, Jimmy, I'm aware of that they want to turn all the workspaces into giant re-education camps. And this is MK Ultra being externalized to the public. I had not seen this clip showing how much evil stuff the WEF puts out. How they just normalize, you're going to eat bugs, you're going to drink sewage water, which LA is now doing. Uh, you're going to live in a 250 square foot uh, 5G oven apartment, coffin apartment. I No, you think Alex Jones would have seen this. I had not seen this. I'm like literally yelling at my producer, you know, I turn my mic off saying, get this, get this, get this. And, and, and that shows why you're important, we're all important, because this assault is so huge. And notice what she said. In Star Trek, when the Borg cube arrives... They say, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. And it's always a woman they hire. They admit in their documents, so it's less threatening. A Siri, pretty woman. A Siri voice. Hey, yeah, don't be scared. It's already here. Don't be scared. So, sorry, Jimmy. I'm, I'm, you guys are so good, though. That is why I'm so excited to be on here. Alex, I, so when I first saw that, it, it freaked me out because it had about 600 views. That's it. I had about 600 views. Yeah. And I, and I watched it three times because I couldn't understand if she was for or against this. Huh. I noticed the guy in the back giggling like hee 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 while she's saying that. Uh, but if you look her up, it's uh, it's called brain transparency. It's I still can't tell if she's for or against it. Oh, it she's seems for to it. be I, I, she's I, for it. She goes, well, it's here, so we have to have this discussion. It's a discussion we're going to have to have. We're going to have to have that. It's here already. But she certainly doesn't look upset by it or scared about it. She's all well, it's giggles. Here, Jimmy. It's well, it's here. But, so, but, but you asked me, have I seen the clip? No, but I do know about the company and I do know about her. So let me tell you the rest of the story. I'm sure you've seen this clip. 
six years ago on national French TV, he also speaks French, like any good supervillain, and German. Klaus Schwab is on national TV, and he says, first in French, the chips will all be in your clothing to buy and sell. <laughs> then they will be in your hand. Then they will be in your brain. And he said this in a bunch of different, some compositing, like five, six interviews he's done. And he says, soon to be part of society, you will all have brain chips, and we will all think, and we will all know what we are all thinking. But, of course, that will all be hacked and controlled and garbage. Imagine the schizophrenic, horrible world where people know what you're thinking or the thing's programmed because your brain's always thinking every subconscious and unconscious is thinking of every scenario, every view. You may be having your baby, you know, wash him in the bathtub. You love him. You protect him. But your mind's thinking, what if I drop him? They'll drown. That can be interpreted. You thought about drowning your baby. So, so the truth is the brain's looking at every aspect all the time at the subconscious and, and, and unconscious level. And so this thing is all fraud. It's all quackery. It's all AI's real power is convincing you that it's better than you, so you hand your authority. Vivek Ramaswamy said something two weeks ago that was so smart that I've said in other ways that I haven't heard anybody else point out. He talked about tennis when AI first came out two decades ago. Would scan, They first put AI in to see if a ball was out, and they found it was way worse than humans calling it. But everybody stopped arguing because they thought, oh, it's a machine. It's better than us. We have to stop handing our authority over to this and just deciding, well, a master computer, Klaus Schwab says this too, under a technocracy, will allot what I get and tell me what job I have. They have cartoons shown in British UK schools a decade ago. It's called Plantopolis that shows the future. And it says, we track your brain waves. Uh, uh, there's like five parts to it. You eat bugs. You're told what you'll be. No one's allowed to have a car. You only get meat once a year. You're only allowed to travel once a year, but it's wonderful and it's good. You watch it as an adult that grew up in some semblance of freedom, and and you think this is this is this is dystopic garbage, but this is being shown to seventh and eighth grade students in the UK called Plantopolis. It's on YouTube, and you watch it, you think it's a joke. But for an unconscious person who just knows you get a bonus, that's the message. You get a bonus when your <laughs> boss reads your brainwaves. And you of course, won't. you don't get to read your boss's brainwaves. So they're also ah. creating a class system. Yes. So tell me what you think of this article. It says Obama-Biden administration legalized neurological surveillance after Trump's election. So in 2016, the U.S. federal government enacted another law to legalize the National Neurological Condition Surveillance System. Now, neurological, that I think I think of brain when I hear them say use that term. This so, is for health, right? So the National Brain Condition Surveillance System is how I read that sentence. Yeah. So the, the National Mind Control System. Yeah. Neurological conditions includes those of the human brain. The 2016 law is partially provided as follows. It's called the Surveillance of Neurological Diseases. It says, in general, the Secretary of the Human Health Services, acting through the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and in coordination with other agencies as the Secretary determines, shall, as appropriate, enhance and expand infrastructure and activities to track the epidemiology of neurological diseases and incorporate information obtained through such activities into integrated surveillance system, uh, which may consist of or include a registry to be known as the National Brain Condition Surveillance System. Wow. The National Neural... It, and that there it is. There's the Trojan horse, your brain health. What did I just say? What did I just say 15 minutes ago before you brought this up? Any, for new viewers, I swear this sounds insane. It's not. It's called the Intergalactic Communications Network or system. That's what they said in 60. They said, we don't have the computers yet, 1960. But they said, we're going to have all these computers that surveil you. And then if somebody's heart rate goes up, we'll know and we'll send police to their house. That's one of the things they put in the paper. So, so yeah, this is, th this is not the Internet of Things. This is the Internet of Mind Control. And that's what they're all rolling out right now. So they're all given a script. And they're told, whether it's Zuckerberg or her or Klaus Schwab or Bill Gates, they're all in this big combine. They're all in this mind control, scientific, mad scientist cult. And they're all told, okay, now it's time to roll out the next phase. And this is going on right now. They have the UN Treaty, the latest draft, takes control of our national medical responses to any new disease, 
allows them to arrest or round up or take anybody they want away. Anybody that gets in the way of the lockdown and public safety can also be disappeared. And the UN sets the policy. Who created the UN? The military industrial complex at the end of World War II to establish the world government. I wanted to show this clip of from uh, Tucker Carlson. It's a very short clip, and I wanted to get your reaction to it. If you live in a society where the people in charge just want to sell you out to get rich, that's bad. But that's not what we're watching. We're watching something much darker than that. So the objective of, I would say, the entire administration and its enablers in the Republican Party, which is most elected officials there, is to destroy the United States, the recognizable United States, the country you grew up in, the country you've been living in, say, 10 years ago. And that's kind of obvious to everyone. But too few people pause and ask, well, what is that? Like, these people live here. They don't all have secret island getaways, especially now that Epstein is gone. <laughs> and so if they succeed in their project of destroying the United States, where are they going to go? It's a little bit like burning your own house down. So why would you do that? That's not just an act of destruction, it's an act of self-destruction. So is that a political program? No. A political program is designed to help the people who institute it and their voters and donors. Their program helps nobody. So I've been kind of developing my own theory on this, Alex, that what about... so. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, Xi Jinping visited San Francisco. And if you've ever been to San Francisco, there's homeless people everywhere. Well, they cleaned that up for Xi Jinping to come there. And just like so a couple of years ago, Gavin Newsom announced that there was a $40 billion surplus. You could put Alex up. There was a $40 billion surplus in California. And I was like, well, I bet he's going to clean up homelessness and he's going to give people health care. And they did nothing. They did nothing with that $40 billion, and now they're saying it's all gone, and I don't know, and no one knows where it went. And so we know that they could clean, they could end homelessness in America for a fraction of the money that they sent to Ukraine at the blink of an eye. And restart it and end it again. That's right. They could have fixed it four or five times over, and they could have sent everybody to college for free. They won't do any of that. So it's it's I'm developing this theory that— they're wanting us to be on edge and they want us just like Tucker had talked about it when he was on our show. They want you to when you go to the 7-Eleven, you have to step over a homeless person and everything's locked up behind cages and you're going to get a crazy person screaming at you so that you will welcome authoritarianism. Right. Just like with the terrorist attack on 9-11 did. We became a surveillance state. People gave up their freedoms. By the way, the Patriot Act was on a shelf for years. They were waiting to implement that. And so. People just forgot that every email, every text, every phone call they make is being recorded and taken and, and uh, c categorized and collected by the government. And so I've tried to st I'm starting to develop a theory like so it, they keep saying that Trump and Trumpers are going to start a civil war. The people starting a civil war are the corporate media, which are beholden to a handful of billionaires, which are beholden to no country. And they, they, it's like they want us fighting. They want us at each other's throats. They want homelessness here. That's why they won't fix it. They want everybody to be on edge and afraid. And and that's what he's, and they're wrecking the country. That's why the border's open for many reasons. One, but we'll talk about that in a second. But go, what, just go ahead and respond to what I said and what Tucker said. Well, that's a profound clip by Tucker. I've heard him say similar things, but I hadn't seen that clip. And I, I really am an expert on this because I read the writings uh, voluminously of Kind of the high priest of these people that you've all know are Hararis and folks. And, and, and so a lot goes into this, uh, but but at, at one level, you're 100% right, and there's some other levels to it, in, in my view. Klaus Schwab has said, we want an angrier world. So they want you to see dystopia and pain. It was declassified that since the 60s, the CIA wanted ugly art, ugly architecture, ugly culture, uh, so that you would accept an uglier world and just get used to it and wouldn't demand beauty and, and and wouldn't go along with 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 people that wanted a better world because they were about to end the experiment of America with all its problems and all the issues. It was the wild, wild west and people could come here. It was the best house in a bad neighborhood and they could really aspire to be a maverick, 
and to innovate. Every other place had shut down innovation oh. because elites didn't want anything to challenge their monopoly of hegemonic control. That's why feudalism looks the same everywhere. You keep people on tiny pieces of land uh, in every culture, in Japan, ancient Europe, you name it. The nobles were a foot or two higher than the, than the serfs because they'd been uh, kept at starvation levels for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a management system to keep people dumb and poor. You know, like the famous uh, comedian George Carlin said, they want you dumb, they want you stupid, and and you know just you know just passive enough to do the work un un until you you know retire, and then they can steal your pension. And so now, <laughs> with robots and all the rest of this stuff, they don't even need people. Life was always cheap. Now it's seen as we're eating up their resources. So they don't want the world to aspire to a two-car garage and a vacation and health care and a, 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 a small swimming pool in the backyard and access to medical care. With all this technology and all this <clears throat> science, we should be working it. They have all the actuaries two, three days a week living like kings. But instead, they set up legal systems and corporate systems and tax systems that tax the middle class and the poor, give people benefits only for the social controls that come out of it so they can manage us as serfs. But then it gets worse. If you talk to, when, when I've covered Bilderberg myself more than 10 times, my crew many other times, we get into the hotel a few days before they close it. And we, I hand out a card and I say, when the Bilderberg group comes here to the, to the, to the waiters and to the staff and to the bartender, to, to the bellhop, when they come here and you see how rude and evil and mean they are and you hear what they're saying, here's my phone number, call me and give me information. If you can get any papers or things they throw in the trash, give them to me. I learned that from Jim Tucker, an old reporter that had been covering them since the uh, since the 70s. And he's dead now, but he, he was a really interesting, you know, old-fashioned gumshoe. And so they would then be so rude and so mean and never give a one-cent tip. None of them give tips. Hillary Clinton at a restaurant gives no tip. A lot of times skips out on it. And they're all like this. Gavin Newsom, I've told people that know him, they're all like this because they are such sociopaths slash psychopathic, they're all on that scale, that to them, they don't understand doing good to others comes back to you. They don't get that if they crap in the swimming pool, they've got to close the community pool because they're so rich and powerful, they're disconnected from ever being in a community pool. So they feel so insulated and so disdainful, but deep down, even though their consciousness is evil, their body, their even their genetics still has the old human there so they subconsciously hate themselves. So they then project onto the public their own self-loathing. And, and I've talked to top psychiatrists about psychopaths and, and serial killers. They only feel alive when they're doing something bad or being nasty. And if they do anything nice, they are so hyper-competitive that they feel like they're being cheated. So they're doing all these destructive things. What are their trillions in stolen money going to do when there's a nuclear war? What's it going to do when there's no nice city to go spend the money in? They, they, so, so consciously they go, yeah, we'll dumb everybody down and make them stupid and poor to control them, but they're not even conscious enough to go, that'll blow back because they have such little humanity, they can't even understand that basic thing. Yeah, be hard in business, be serious. Don't let folks push you around, but also realize You've got to not just give a homeless person $10. You've got to create a culture and a society that has things to aspire to and honor and, and competition to where people are brought up to believe in something. But if you believe in something good, you'll become a high-functioning, successful person in your hierarchy of needs. And the final hierarchy, after food and sustenance and medical and family, is, is helping others and, and, and being a pillar because you are connected to everybody. I'm not a collectivist in government makes you collective and makes us collective. No, we are collectivist creatures. We're a hive creature, but through individual determination, making the best decisions and proving what works best, we then collectively opt into the best system and the best collective mode. We still own things. We still have privacy, but it's because we collectively agree on what's good. They want a system that's tyrannical and centralized out of pure avarice and selfishness and greed at, at a, at a, at a overdriving level. And so they are completely against the very civilization that has made them fabulously rich and powerful as parasites. If cancer 
had a consciousness, it, it would say, I better not kill the body. I better just stay this size because I'll die. But cancer doesn't have a consciousness. It, if it had a consciousness, it would be thinking, I'm all powerful. I can't be stopped. Look at me. I'm taking over the brain, the lungs, the bones, the blood. I'm taking over the skin. But the whole thing dies. So they're like a conscious cancer that doesn't care it's destroying the host. And so they don't have that connectedness with us. And so that's why they are the plague. And that's why... Humanity goes through cycles. We all know that. We're in a major turning right now, the fourth turning. And the globalists know that, so they want complete control and power because they know their old system's about to die. They want to have the Great Reset that I cover in my book, The Great Awakening, that's already a bestseller, to have even greater tyranny out of the collapse of their old parasitic financial system. And so we're now at that point where they're trying to double down instead of in the cycle of uh, hard times make strong men, Strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Weak men make bad times. And then bad times make strong men. Obama and others call it the end of history. And they want such a scientific, factory-farmed, dumbed-down population that they even allow to be around. They want 500 million. That's official number. So they want to get rid of 7.5 million people. And they want factory-farmed people that they mind control, they control, they read the thoughts of, they control the thoughts of, and the dreams of, so they can play God. This is the dystopic, mad scientist hell they're building, and that's why they're at war against the natural order, because the natural order isn't conducive to the cancer taking over. And so, how do, would you define who, when you keep when you say they, how, how do you define they? Who is the they? There are sociopaths and psychopaths in the Chinese government and corporations. There are sociopaths and psychopaths in the German government. There are sociopaths and psychopaths in the U.S. government. There are sociopaths and psychopaths in the Israeli government. There are sociopaths and psychopaths in the Russian government. But they've already been through 80-plus years of this, so they're in many ways having a renaissance and trying <coughs> to, 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 to get away from it, whereas we haven't fully gone <coughs> to the bottom yet, so we're going deeper into it. But if you want to know who runs it, BlackRock, is, you know this, you've covered it, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, all controlled by the same group of less than a dozen managers, control 88% of world assets and wealth, and they've said, we'll use this to control people. They want to cut off our resources. They're saying, you know, we can't take showers or wash our clothes. It's an Obama told Africans you can't have a car or air conditioning, mm -hmm. but he can have jumbo jets and, yeah. you know, palatial, you know, things, uh, you know, all over the place. And, and so it's a religion of do as I say, not as I do, I'm an anointed one. I'm a priest class. I rule over you. You're a serf. You have nothing. And, it, and it, we know who runs it. The handful of families and groups that control BlackRock, just like you mentioned Network, is their revelation of the method. They're telling you right there. They have a plan for humanity. They want to just dumb us down and brush us aside. And then they control the defense contractors, big pharma, they bring up the politicians they control. They penetrate the cabinets, as Klaus Schwab said. The, the WEF is just their spokesperson group. It's just their PR firm. And they, they have stolen the world's wealth, and they believe it's owned by them. And they believe, like when you go into your pantry to get some flour and there's weevils in it, uh, you kill the weevils. And then they see us as just, I mean, they say this. We, there's too many people. We got to get rid of them. We don't need all these humans anymore. Well, we don't need you, Klaus Schwab, or you've all know a Harari. And, and then some people say, well, is it this conspiracy or is it th that group? Klaus Schwab's family were Nazis. Yuval Harari's weren't. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping helped round up his own family in the Cultural Revolution and watches his father and family were attacked and his sister was tortured. And he agreed with it. So he was rewarded by the parasitic system to be the leader of the country and a dictator to serve that ruling communist oligarchy because he literally stood by while his father was pilloried in the town square and while his sister was beaten to death. And so he's so, so committed to the party, he was rewarded in the top slot. And, and so he's just a manifestation. So if you look at the brain of a Henry Kissinger and the brain of a Zbigniew Brzezinski, one is Chinese, one is Jewish, or the mind of Adolf Hitler. Hitler said everybody else is weak and dumb, survival of the fittest, social Darwinism, we're going to kill everybody uh, that doesn't go along with us, and, and, and some will be left as slaves, but really we'll get rid of them later. Uh, I mean, the, the, and people say, well, why is Yuval Noah Harari 
saying we don't need humans, it's time to get rid of people, the future's not human. Hitler just said the future isn't anybody but an Aryan, which is bad enough. Yuvaldo Harari says the future ain't even human. That's a quote. He says humans are gone by 2047. And, and you can read NBC headlines, the same thing. A New York Times headlines, looking forward to the end of humanity. I'm in the grocery store checkout lane. Saw a similar headline last week. It's telling you, you're garbage. You're filth. You killed the earth. Don't have a life force. Don't have a survival instinct. You're killing everything. Look at the garbage. Look at the homeless. Look at the everything. G die. Roll over. Don't live. Don't thrive. Don't contend for the future. Don't affect the future because we have the renaissance system of believing in humans and egalitarianism and classical liberalism and really empowering people but doing it through the classical human system that's the great awakening that we're in that's countering the great reset the war against the globalists defeating the globalists and launching the next great renaissance and they can't compete with that they are a evil stinking witch yeah, uh, that, that's literally trying to hand out poison apples versus Marilyn Monroe in their prime. Freedom in the Renaissance and liberalism, real liberalism, is Marilyn Monroe in her prime. And the New World Order is like a skexy from the Dark Crystal. They have to make everything ugly because they're ugly spiritually, culturally, metaphysically, and they need everything ugly to camouflage themselves because they're so fallen. So... I just learned recently that that the AP, the news service, the AP, the owners of the AP, is it the Rothschilds? They're, they own a lot of stuff through BlackRock. They also own The Economist magazine. Uh, and yeah, the Rothschilds, and that's a whole other story. I'm sure you know it. But the British Empire was dominant until 1815. <clears throat> but it was in complete control for 100 years after that because the Battle of Waterloo uh, was so decisive defeating the continental forces of Napoleon Bonaparte for the second time with the Prussian uh, British pincer attack that the Rothschilds, this is on record, sent a carrier pigeon to a fast Corvette ship to race across and to tell everyone when the stock market opened that morning that Napoleon had won and that Lord Wellington had been smashed. And the stock market went down 99%. The Rothschilds then bought up 99%, this is on record, 99% of the stock market. So they weren't just the richest family in the world up until that point. They, they were the richest family in the world up until that point on record. Okay? Married into the British royalty, everything. Then after 1815, the Battle of Waterloo, they owned the British Empire. They All the major stocks, they got it. Of course, Napoleon really lost. And they only had six hours. Six hours before they came in and said, no, Wellington has won. Wellington has won, and then it all shot back up above where it even was. So look for them to do this again with a cyber attack. They're saying Trump supporters with no evidence working with Putin are going to cyber attack to cancel the election. The election he's 10 points ahead in or more. So, so yeah, they'll use major crises and calamities to consolidate power, and the Anglo-American establishment, there's a tripolar world. There's the Russians, who are the junior. There are the Chinese that are the middle group. And the Anglo-American British Empire that Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor, wrote an 1,100-page book bragging about, from their perspective, their right to rule, how they were going to take over the world. In 1967, yeah. he wrote it. And uh, so, so, so Brigitte Brzezinski wrote books admitting this. They all admit this at the academic level like we're yeah. dumb animals. I'm just reading what they're actually saying. And they, in mainline PhD history books, they admit all this about the Rothschilds. Now, I go on air and say it, they yeah. go, oh, anti-Semitic. It has <laughs> nothing to do with Jews to say that the Rothschilds did this and are super powerful, or, or, the, or, or the Chinese, because Xi Jinping is, is bad. Am I saying Chinese are bad? No, I'm not. But, but it really is true that that's how a German-Jewish banking family who ran pawn shops, basically, in Germany and, and loaned money to people, that's how they parlayed their wealth from 500 years ago, by 1815, to rule most of the earth. The sun never set on the British Empire. Then World War I, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had gotten so dominant, I don't mean to give a history lesson, but it's important to know, that the British intelligence of the Black Hand assassinate Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke, the, the Germans all go crazy, because uh, they were winning with all the new patents, all the new science. 
Uh, the British newspapers were talking about the German problem, and you know they're going to. Def- so the British Empire was was corrupt, overextended, in, in uh, and, and so World War One was started by them. World War Two was Hitler; he was bad. But the Versailles Treaty and all that led to Hitler coming to power. There's a lot of evidence British intelligence didn't control Hitler, but nudged him and funded him early on to have a new enemy. And so that's really how this world has been operating. It's it's how it's been done. And so. After World War I, the British Empire said, made a deal, and even Teddy Roosevelt wrote about this. Uh, it was uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill wrote the three volumes set, the histories of the British speaking peoples. Yeah. Uh, he was half American. He says in there, we came over after World War I, we set up the CFR, mm-hmm. we merged British intelligence uh, with <clears throat> US intelligence. Right. And then that is the Anglo American Empire. They call it yeah. themselves. And Putin says, I'm fighting the Anglo-American elite. Yep. I, in, I have no problems with the with, with the Americans. He said, I have a problem with your Anglo-American oligarchs. He calls us the Anglo-Americans. And who are they? The Anglo-Americans come from a Norse tribe that later became William the Conqueror and took over France. And they came and took over England. So if, if, if you go back to all of this, they take the name of William the Conqueror's group from a thousand years ago. Alex, have you seen a, and it's unbelievable if you ever see it, there's a movie about the Rothschilds that's black and white that's made by them to promote them and it looks like something Hitler made to smear them. And it's their thing bragging about their family history. It's unbelievable. No, I haven't seen that. Yeah, they made, like keep in mind, they made it themselves. Isn't this great? And you're like, (laughs) it's crazy if you ever, you, you find it. Well, uh, I wanted to just touch on the immigration problem because I've totally flipped on this. And I was always the more immigrants, the better, which I still love immigrants. We're a whole country of immigrants. Um, But I noticed that it's being, this situation is being manipulated and I couldn't really put my finger on why, Uh, why are they having an open border and what, what, which they are. And right now you have uh, cities, uh, Eric Adams in New York is screaming <laughs> that their whole city is going to going down the toilet because they can't handle the influx of all these uh, immigrants that are coming to the, his city. It used to be a sanctuary city, and now he's trying to find a way to get them to stop, but they're not stopping. And he, I was listening to Dick Durbin, who's a senator from my old home state, Illinois, and listen to what he says. Here's one of the reasons why they want to get as many immigrants as they can in here. Watch this. The presiding officer, my colleague from the state of Illinois, has legislation which addresses one aspect of that. Her bill, and I hope I describe it accurately, says that if you are an undocumented person in this country and you can pass the physical and the required test, background test, the like, you can serve in our military, and if you do it honorably, we will make you citizens of the United States. Do we need that? Do you know what the recruiting numbers are at the Army and the Navy and the Air Force? They can't reach their quotas each month. They can't find enough people to join our military forces. And there are those who are undocumented who want the chance to serve and risk their lives for this country. They don't want to serve in their own military in their own country. They want to go to a foreign country and serve in their military. This is according. <laughs> That's so, called mercenaries. Yeah, this is yeah. this is kind of how this is how Rome ended. No, and uh, yes. so this so he's giving the game away there. He says it right out in the open. We have to fill our military with foreigners, Leader like cops, and our farms, and 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 <laughs> and and have our be our farm workers, have have them be our yep. medical workers and our military, and have them be our cops. This seems bad. Well, it's so bad. Here's what Eric Adams says about it. We're seeing uh, the erosion of the quality of life that we've improved on in such a short period of time of this administration. And we have been impacted. Uh, for, for many uh, months, we were able to keep the visualization of this crisis from hitting our streets, but we have reached a breaking point. We're no longer able to do that because of the volume and numbers. Just last week, we had 3,900 people that arrived here. We are averaging anywhere from 2,500 to close to 4,000 a week. And if you do the math, you see that's 8,000 every two weeks, potentially 16,000 a month that we must feed, clothe, house, educate children, 
and all the services that you would give a normal adult. And we're seeing that play out on our streets of New York. And that is what the breaking point looks like, what we are experiencing right now. So we're he's seeing, he's, he's saying seeing, that, uh, the, that New York is at the breaking point, yet there's nobody that has a solution to this. Nobody even wants to, seems like they want to do anything about it. Well, I, I can uh, tell you exactly what's going on, and you're, 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 you're dead on. Look, there's UN documents. Before that, there's a 100-year-old called Kalergi plan in Europe. And the royalty got together, and they said, our people are too uppity. But if we bring in giant third-world populations that we control yep. and that we put on government jobs and government assistance, it'll be a new Praetorian guard for us. But, but it's worse than that. If you go back to the lockdowns that only went on for like a year and a half here, or in Europe or Australia, they went on under IMF World Bank control over those countries that are in deep debt to, to the central banks. They were under two, two and a half, three year lockdowns and they did big polls of the migrants. And they said, there's no jobs, the farms are shut, the factories are shut, I'm starving to death, I've got to come here. So they're victims of globalism being shut down. And yeah, our country needs new people, we're an aging population, we're not having more children, we're not having replacement rate. So I'm all for bringing people in, and, 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 and immigration is what founded this country, absolutely. But when you organize them in UN camps, give them debit cards to get here, and you bring in uh, you know, millions and millions and millions a year into an infrastructure that's already falling apart with uh, the, the, the services being cut, with massive inflation, it lowers wages. It doesn't help the third world, like Ross Perot said. It hurts the third world. They fall more. We fall down. And the globalists have this big population. And then all these blue cities have passed laws for illegals to vote in local elections. They're under the control of the local community organizers. They're told how to vote. Now they get fast-tracked in the military. <laughs> they purge the military with the shots and critical race theory. And, and, and so all the professionals get out. And then now they're going to replace it with the domestic security force that Obama talked about that's just as big and just as strong as our military. And Illinois and other states are passing laws to have illegal aliens, as your co-host said, be the police. So you, you nailed it. History doesn't just rhyme, it repeats. Rome started doing this, and in a couple hundred years they collapsed because the enforcers they brought in said, hey, we're the bosses. Well, this won't take hundreds of years. Everything now is compressed. <laughs> Everything is accelerated. There's more change now in a year than you know happened the previous ten, and that's going to get more accelerated in, in a type of singularity. I don't believe in a pure singularity or a total singularity, but but it's it's definitely going towards that. So they lock down the third world, and then Al Gore says, "Man, a, a climate change is what's making a billion people." He said last week on TV. Come here. Well, it's funny. In the UN replacement migration document that they say doesn't exist, and you're racist if you pointed out from the year 2000 and 2001, or several of them, official UN policy is to bring the third world here. And they say climate change will be the reason, then we'll bring them here. No, the policies of shutting those countries down and then flooding us, you know, tens of millions extra starved to death, the UN admits, during the lockdowns. They blame the virus. It was the lockdown. So they destroy the third world and then do reverse colonization, bringing these groups in. And, and, and then they put many of them, as you know, working 15 hours a day, as young as 12 years old, uh, in tire factories and cereal factories. And kids get caught in the machines and their fingers and arms get cut off. And it's back of the newspaper. And then you've got all the sex slavery. And they've lost track of 87,000 children uh, and 400 plus thousand. They don't know where they're at either. I, I mean, folks. This is the jungle 2.0. This is, this is absolute dehumanization, and this is lowering the standards, not helping the third world, but lowering them and lowering us again so no one can aspire to the big carbon footprint. Austerity is good. Humans are bad. Cows are evil. We've got to get rid of them. The cow farts are bad. Well, we fart too. And I said that years ago. I said, when they're done going after the cows, which they've started, Netherlands is getting rid of a bunch, Ireland, you name it, Sri Lanka, massive starvation, riots in Sri Lanka. Notice what they I said, next will be our breath is bad. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today, London Guardian, yeah. all two weeks ago said breathing is bad for the earth. No, yeah. the, the gases we put off hold actually in 
the sun. They, 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 we're off gassing into space. We have to continue to put gas into the atmosphere. You can debate this all day, but they know that's how it works. So now they've officially said breathing is bad. Well, whales breathe, dolphins breathe, uh, chipmunks breathe, birds breathe, lizards breathe, insects breathe. So imagine the mania. Two men can have a baby. There are no longer Y and X chromosomes. That Bill Nye, the science guy, teaches that officially. Of course. And your, your breath is evil. Also you human evil. farts. They all say about human farting, not yeah. just cows. Right. You have to buy Absolutely. fart credits. <clears throat> yeah. yes. I have fart offsets I buy for the year. <laughs> and I know this is all exhausting, folks, but that's why I'm so freaked out. I've been, I've known about this 40 years because I had family that told me about it from the inside. And, and, and now I, I'm just some guy up here trying to warn people I'm not perfect. And I'm just telling folks I'm not the threat. Jimmy's not the threat. Tucker Carl's is not the threat. We at least know we live here. We at least know that you can't have nuclear reactors, almost all of them leaking, while you cut off all the coal power. I mean, we know the ship is sinking. And they think they're going to sink it with the Great Reset and then build back better their new system. And so... Again, I'll plug it because they're trying to shut me down. I need the funds, and I appreciate you letting me do it. Plus, these are really good books. This went to number one. New York Times wouldn't put it in their bestseller, but it went to number one, Wall Street Journal, USA list. This book has, has been the top of the charts. It's part two. It's twice as thick. You've got the Death Star plans, the Great Reset, and the War for the World. And then you've got the Great Awakening, Defeating the Globalists. This gets into it, and this lays out an alternate team humanity program. I was on with Elon Musk, again, a few weeks ago for two and a half hours. And he said, yeah, the globalists want to depopulate us. They want to destroy civilization. We may never be able to restart it once they cut it off. Fossil fuels aren't perfect. We need to phase them out, but they're a bridge. It'll take decades to do it. What they're doing now, I've looked at the numbers. This is Elon Musk. We'll cause billions to starve to death, and that'll cause giant wars. We can't do it. And I said, what do we call this, Elon? I said, we should call this Team Humanity <coughs> versus Team Death Cult. And he said, I agree. Let's call it Team Humanity. Well, Team Humanity is in this book, and I hope people will go to InfoWarsStore.com and get it, and that'll help keep my broadcast embattled on the air, because contrary to what they're saying, we're more influential now than ever. Thanks for coming back on X. We've exploded. Thank God for that. You've exploded. Anybody telling the truth is exploding. But we are trying to build back. We're trying to get more reporters. We're trying to really, in this election cycle, be on the ground. So I hope people will get the books because they're really powerful. Who is the co-author of that Great Awakening? Kit Heavenlive, heck and lively, great guy. I mean, what happened is I recorded a bunch of stuff, gave him hundreds of articles and documents, really thousands. It was 800 pages long when I'd written it. And then Kent and their lawyers, he's a lawyer too, because, you know, I'm Alex Jones, they fact-checked everything. And there was one thing I put in the book that they couldn't prove. It was theoretical, the story of you put fleas in a jar and they learn they can't jump out of it. And then once you take them out of the jar, they never jump higher than the jar. And I, I thought it was a good allegory, but I put it in the book like it was true. Turned out no one can prove it ever happened, but it's a good theoretical analogy. That was the one thing out of 800 pages uh, that they couldn't prove. Everything else, they vetted everything. Of course, that got cut from the book, uh, but and it got cut to 400 pages. Uh, but this is kind of stream of consciousness Alex Jones, The Great Awakening. And this is what I actually say. A lot of people are going to watch this. Millions. I bet 10 million people watch this the next week. And they're going to say, I never knew this guy talked about all this because all they see, and, and they're going to do this. They're going to take they're going to take me talking about Willie Nelson's spit, and that'll be the story. <laughs> Instead of, you know, Zuckerberg and the WEF say, we're going to control you in the workplace reading your thoughts. I mean, people should know that they're collectively – Building a digital prison, we're already in it, and now they're thickening the bars and the walls, and the walls are closing in, and we should all say, doesn't matter if you're black, white, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, agnostic, atheist, gay, straight, I don't care. If you want to have a future, and if you don't want to live in a dystopia where you'll own nothing and, quote, be happy, then for heaven's sakes, get educated on this stuff now, folks, because it's real. Jimmy just showed everything he said. He showed you a clip or an article. And I try to do the same thing on my show. And maybe our interpretation's wrong. The point is, we're right about more than we're wrong. I would say I watch your show all the time. 95% accurate. I'm 95% accurate. Uh, and, and that's really a pretty accurate number, folks, because 
stuff so wild, I wouldn't even need to think about making stuff up. I mean, here's a quick example. Three years ago, Bill Gates files a patent for this nanotech that puts little microscopic spikes into your skin to track you and or deliver vaccines. They had articles saying it wasn't true and they weren't planning that even though it was official. He came out last week and officially said they're launching the technology, but spun it like it's no big deal. And he says, you know, the thing is we're going to put vaccines in your food so you basically will comply because you won't know any better. Like a cow. So so again, this this is real. Max so, Blumenthal told us about it. So yeah, he did. And he did uh, Bill Gates was talking about putting mRNA into our plants. And so you don't have to worry about vaccines. That's what he was saying. That's not what I'm saying. So I want uh, And now the EU just announced a new initiative uh where where they say they're getting ready for just like with the last COVID rollout with the mRNA. They, it's, I've got the article right here. It's called Fast Track. And, 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 and they say, oh, we're going to have new stuff for everything, hundreds of new shots a year, but it's going to be in stickers and in food. And just like you get a flu shot quote for free, they're really being paid to give it to you by a government fund. Now you're going to get social credits when you take all these shots. I mean, this is literally them raping our bodies. I mean, physical rape is bad enough. I was on Joe Rogan a few years ago, and I said, the majority of polio is caused by the polio vaccine. And Joe said, Alex, I'm fat-checking that right now. That's not, you know, I can't believe it. Pulls up AP Reuters headline. Again, I'm not saying rape is good of children. It's terrible. It's horrible. We fight it all the time. But if I was a child, I would rather be raped than be given polio and paralyzed for life or killed. So they're raping people with stuff that's killing them. So this is rape. And 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 the UN treaty to take over our bodies and our medical system is rape. And systems to scan our brains at the office is invasion of privacy and rape. If your boss wanted to stick their finger up your butt, you would he would go to jail. He 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 would be sued. But if they want to stick their fingers <laughs> in your brain, it's okay. Well, I think I I think I have to say that uh the polio vaccine, Kurt, is safe and effective, and uh, all vaccines are. All especially vaccines the COVID are, vaccine, especially the COVID slows vaccine, the spread. and it certainly does slow oh, the spread. Look at that spread slowing. Look at it, and uh, it so, works. No, no, actually, yeah, it, it's all. No one search engine. Majority of new polio cases caused by vaccine. That's not. That's no. It's actually true. But you, you're right. You can't even say stuff that's true because we're not a doctor, Fauci. Did you see the clip of him that resurfaced where he said? We're going to get past all the BS. He said, B, he spelled it out. He said, we're going to get past the BS by locking people down. And that'll teach them. And then they'll drop the BS, and take the shot. It's all coercion, people. And that's A called nudge. bullying. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't say anything that contradicts the FDA, the CDC, or the WHO. And that's normal in a democracy, And that's normal in a democracy. Well, I look and, down on China, frankly, because they I don't just, have freedom. I just have to say that no, you're right. I, I, look, I apologize. That was a joke. Every shot works perfectly. The swine flu shots in the 70s didn't hurt anybody. Um, uh, the, the anthrax shots did not get pulled by the Pentagon both times because it killed a bunch of people. Everybody no. loved the anthrax shot. That's right. It, it was perfect. The mRNA shot works perfectly. Yes. Uh, it actually cures myocarditis. There, there, are, um, there might be side it's effects. It's climate change doing it, but they, but they are rare, and uh, it it will keep you from getting seriously ill, hospitalized. Did you or hear death. about Holiday Heart? All the articles that everybody's suddenly having heart attacks. It's quite normal. No, a Holiday Heart. It's it's, it's probably holiday from the holidays. Heart. That's what the Grinch got. The Grinch got it's, at the it's, end. It's he probably called from the Holiday Heart. <laughs> so I, I just have to show you the reach of Bill Gates, who funds the WHO, and I'm on YouTube and Google, and I'm not allowed to contradict them which means i'm not allowed to contradict bill gates who's just a simple farmer and uh so hey bill gates is my doctor i love the fact that he used to sell crappy software and got busted for running a monopoly and was loading stuff onto it to control i mean no i want him to be in charge of my life i love bill gates i i i, I think it's good that he spends two billion dollars <laughs> a year on u.s media and then they underwrite it and don't even tell you that he's paying for these programs 
about how great he is. I think that's totally normal, Jimmy. Not, not, cool. not only does he fund the journalism schools, he then funds the journalism outlets, and then he funds the products that the journalists that he <laughs> fought and paid for are now going to cover. It's uh, it's, it's really quite cares. a scam that he's pulled off. But I no, just no, it's not a scam, Jimmy. Bill Gates was going to Epstein Island all those times to stop uh, and, and or hanging out with uh, with. Uh, on the Lita Express to save children. He's actually a superhero. <laughs> and, and it was actually Bill Gates, you know, that went in there into the prison. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, and, and trying to tell him to be more careful next Epstein. time. Yeah, he's trying. Like those guys on To Catch a Predator. Like, I just want to warn him it's dangerous. <laughs> you can't be well, do you remember what happened when they asked Bill Gates on, on PBS? They said, yeah. You know, he grabbed his own Jeffrey throat. Epstein? He said, well, <laughs> he's dead now, so you got to be careful. Yeah, that's what he said yeah. to Judy Woodruff because he did not expect her to press him on that because he funds that show. That that's another thing. They didn't have a, a science and medical yeah. department at that show until he funded it. And then he couldn't believe she was pushing back on him. And I just have to say once again that the the vaccines are safe and effective, especially the polio and the covid one. They're fantastic. The WHO, the F CDC and the FDA endorse them. I'll take it a step further and say the lockdowns worked. And, and not only that, masks work. Masks work for sure. Hey, 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 WHO hey, hey, said hey. they didn't, by the way, but I say let they me just do. say this real quick. Let me just say this real quick. This is important. I want to say that when President Biden said, if you take the shot, you can't get it or spread it was true. Yeah. When Rachel Maddow says, when you get the shot, you can't get it or spread it. That's all true, folks. That's why they want you to take eight of them, because one works so well. <laughs> I want to show you this. Tucker Carlson said this, and he was talking about UFOs. And I want to get your reaction to what he says here. This, these are my views. OK, they can't be proven. Uh, but they're, I think they're informed views. Um, the, the, the phenomenon is real. It's been recorded for thousands of years. We know that. Um, there's something buzzing around us in the skies, but also uh, under the oceans, we now know, and probably underground as well. Um, so it's real. Uh, the government's lied about it a million different ways, probably for a million different reasons for at least 80 years. That's also confirmed. They're lying about it now. Who knows what their motives are? And they're also trying to keep a lot of this stuff from being disclosed. That's true. Yes. So, so to those people, it's like, it's a PSYOP. Well, yeah, uh, everything's a PSYOP, but I know for a dead certain fact, and it's provable that, say, Mitch McConnell and Speaker Johnson and people who should, and a couple committee chairmen who should all know better are trying to prevent the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023 from taking effect in a meaningful way. So they are trying to hide it still. That's a fact. My own view is that these are not aliens. Um, there's no evidence that they've come from somewhere else. We would probably know. We've got a lot of a lot of technology that's watching what comes in and out of the atmosphere, and there's no evidence of that. I think they've been here forever. Hmm. Um, I'm, I don't, they're not, I don't, this is my view. Again, it can't be proven, but I'm just telling you after a lot of conversations, um, I think it's likely that the U.S. government has con had contact with these, uh, direct contact, and, you know, over a period of years, I find that really disturbing. Um, because I, you know, and, and, a, and a bunch of other things that I, that are highly distressing that I can't prove, and so I'm not going to throw them out there, but I can, I'll can. i tell you this. I've talked to a lot of people about this, not because I've never been interested in UFOs until like five years ago, and I was like, wait, this is real. What is this? Why aren't we talking about this? I'm just like coming at it from a totally idiotic, I don't know anything, curious position, which is my normal posture on everything. And so I've talked to a lot of people, and my view is that there, you know, this is my opinion, that there are things about this that are really disturbing. And while I hate any kind of government secrecy, and if I could prove any of this, I would say it immediately, consequences be damned, I do sort of understand why they don't want to let this stuff out. It's not about, oh, we've got fragments of one of these crafts at a Lockheed you know, facility in California, and we have biologics from the craft. You know, everyone knows that that's likely true. Well, it's certainly true that they have the you know, pieces of this stuff. Yep. But I think it's likely that it's 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 darker than that and that the u.s government is i said the u.s government people in the u.s government not the u.s government but you know there are parts it's a vast it's the largest human organization in history parts of it you know have knowledge that is very very disturbing and um i personally think strongly think um that there's a spiritual component to this that i don't understand and will not pretend to understand um but i think it's very clear that there's a spiritual component to this. That's one of the reasons the Vatican, and I'm, again, I'm not Catholic, but has been involved in this for over 100 years as an observatory, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that these are not men from Mars. That I think that was a PSYOP, because I think the truth is a little bit wilder and has deeper implications just then.
than that. So what do you think he's talking about there? He's he, Go ahead. Well, I have to be really careful here because, you know, I, I, I'm friends with Tucker. I hang out with his son, you know, go hunting with him and shooting and go visit him and, and, and things like that. And, in fact, I invited him to come out to Florida sometime next month. And I just love Tucker, love to death. He thought I was a psychopath 15 years ago for saying 9-11 was an inside job in Building 7. And then his children, who were down in college and stuff, and out of college, started bringing him stuff and saying, no, Dad, this guy's you know pretty good. We like him. So he came to visit me 11, 12 years ago and kind of halfway apologized. He said, I thought you were a sociopath and just saying all this stuff to, you know for ratings, but I've, I've found out you're a really good guy. And uh, then Tucker has really listens to me a lot now, and it's also other people. And from my research of the globalist and what they're really doing in DMT research in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and that also goes to a connection uh, to a family friend who was the uh, deputy head uh, of a, a major psychedelic research uh, group uh, in San Francisco. And I was about, when I first heard this, I was about seven years old on a trip in the back of my mom's Volkswagen Beetle with her and her friend to uh, to for a week-long trip with the girls to uh, Arkansas where they went on a you know, tourist trip checking out all the cool sites there. Really beautiful there. And I'm sitting in the back with my etch and sketch and comic books, uh, listening to this lady, uh, CIA, uh, talk about how they're basically astronauts and they put them on DMT drips. This is before anybody was talking about DMT and they go in and they model th th this, this veil or the other uh, dimensions that are there. <coughs> and they, they then communicate with these entities and they come back and then, and then write notes about it. Um, and then I did later research once I grew up and knew about this. They also have volunteers uh, where they actually st stop the heart and uh, kill people for a couple minutes uh, so that they can have these out-of-body experiences. Because what it is third dimensionally, they call it spiritual. That's what the ancients called it. <clears throat> what the globalists actually believe, what the evidence is, is there's 12 dimensions we know about just in this, 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 this verse versus multiverses. And the third dimension is the first material zone and kind of a jump point, kind of a doorway or a wormhole. And uh, you know, all the hundreds of billions of galaxies that you know, they've already photographed. And now they know the Big Bang goes back further and there's other Big Bang stuff coming in and it isn't what they thought. Uh, and it really looks like the tail of a propulsion system is going out the back of something. And that's basically what these interdimensional aliens are, but they're not aliens, they're from here. And, and, and so I told Joe Rogan that like six years ago on his show, and, no, and that was not in the news then. And, and six months later, a big professor came out and said, yeah, in Japan, England, and the U.S., and San Francisco, for decades, we it's like astronauts. We take the, take the DMT, and they go in, and they map all this. And the ancients would take a bunch of drugs and get in the middle of a circle. They thought it protected them, Solomon, the Egyptians, all of it. <clears throat> and, a, and a genie or a demon would appear. And they usually wanted the sacrifice of blood to, to give you knowledge. And you can read this in the Graham Gwynn War and Black Magic books that are, you know, thousands of years old, <laughs> translated into French. And, and so that's where all this comes from with psychedelics and, you know, and the ancients and then all the other cultures taking these drugs is that they believe they're talking to the gods and the servants of the gods. But the rule is the higher level angels or good guys don't interfere uh, in the third dimensional manifestation of our bodies that is a dimensional manifestation or signature of something much larger. So this is kind of the tether of what we are and, and, and a, a signature or footprint uh, that's interdimensionally there. It's way more complex than that, but basically that, that that's where these people have these experiences. That's where people that have never taken drugs, have no mental illness in their family, uh, will walk into their bedroom and a poltergeist will appear or won't and will throw you up onto the ceiling or we'll put giant bloody scratch marks across your chest. And, and, and so more and more people are having this experience. Uh, and so they didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in aliens till they get demonically attacked. And I'm not going to say who this has happened to, but let's just say it's happening to a lot of people and they're suddenly discovering all this and trying to then say, what did this to me? I'm not drinking. I'm not on drugs. And I just got, it's usually when you're alone uh, and, the, and, 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 and these things will attack you. And so that's, that's really what's going on. And, and, and so now they have these DMT retreats uh, in Costa Rica and in Peru, and they'll go to... The ayahuasca? 
Yeah, yeah. Iowa, well, ayahuasca and DMT retreats. Yeah, ayahuasca retreats, yes. Well, they'll, they'll do both. A lot of I began, you name it. And but mainly ayahuasca, you're right. They will go to these temple sites and pay more money because the temple sites, you don't get little elves that are kind of uh NPCs of the other dimensions. Okay, and, and, and they look like elves to take their mask off. It's like gray aliens. It's kind of a robot that's everywhere. If you go to the ancient sacrificial sites or Stonehenge or places where, where there's these, these portals, they believe, or because so much blood's been spilled, you don't, you don't talk to that. You, you, you might talk to something that looks like an angel, something that looks like a 400-foot praying mantis. And what's happening is, and I've talked to big talk show hosts that have gone and done this, you're there with 30, 40 people. And you take the drugs, and everyone sees the aliens come out of the forest up to the temple, and you're all seeing the aliens at the same time. It's not, it's not a group hallucination. You've lifted the interdimensional veil, because here's the deal. <clears throat> they say your eyes see a very narrow spectrum of the light spectrum, and there's electromagnetic, there's infrared, there's thousands of different types of, of things coming in that your optic nerve doesn't see. But the truth is, a bloodhound is like a 1,000 times better than a human. The average dog, 300 times or so. If we could smell everything a bloodhound smelled, we'd go crazy. So it's the same thing. Our optic nerve is tuned to this environment and this evolutionary plane. But the truth is the eyes and the brain are actually, that's why a cat will look over you and there's nothing there and it'll see something and run out of the room because cats have a larger optic thing. So do dogs, not as much as a cat. Cats have better eyes, dogs have better noses. Slit eyes. Cats have better noses than we do. So, so, so yeah, so what's happening, what's happening is we're in a universe that's teeming with energy, teeming with consciousnesses, but we're dialed down because you couldn't have a wife or a husband and go plant corn in the field and, you know, do your work if you could see all the different things interdimensionally that are there. And, 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 and so I naturally have a 21-inch neck and, 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 and have really bad sleep apnea since I was a kid because I guess it's, you almost call it a birth defect. I mean, my head is huge. And, uh, and my neck's <laughs> huge for my body. And, but, but the point is, is that I, I've had two sleep studies done. I get down to 63% oxygen. And there's only, at night, <clears throat> that causes brain damage long term. But, 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 but there's only one thing in the studies that will bring you into a DMT experience, and that's low oxygen dreams. Well, I have low oxygen dreams. So since I was a small child, and especially when I grew up and got bigger, I, I don't dream in REM sleep the last two hours like most people. I dream from the time I go to bed till the time I wake up eight hours later. And a lot of it is a brain function, going over the data, creating scenarios for the brain. Nicotine also, also Alex. That, I, pardon, nic pardon nicotine, when I would fly on planes, I, I remember I used to knock myself out with Xanx and put a nicotine patch on, and nicotine will make you dream very vividly. So Absolutely, smoke, yeah. because it, it constricts the blood vessels and does a bunch of other stuff. So yes, and so I'm not trying to get mumbo jumbo. I don't go to the churches and believe that stuff. I don't. I know what I objectively know. I know the government's studying it. And, uh, you know, I told Tucker some private stuff. He told me some private stuff. He asked me on his show to go ahead and say it. And, and I said, you know, I'm not going to tell those stories, Tucker, because he said, why not? Tell it right now during a break. He was, you know, we were taking a piss. And, and he and I said, Tucker, why don't you tell your stories? He said, touche. But I tell you what, when Tucker, tell, when Tucker tells his stories, I'll tell mine. And I'm giving you a little bit of a hint here. And I've not broken confidence or anything here. I, I'm just saying that. That, that more and more people are, are having these experiences. I mean, you might be driving down the road and you're not on drugs and it's 8 a.m. in the morning and you have no history of mental illness. You've never seen an hallucination, both optical or, or uh, uh, you know, olfactory. And you look over in your seat and there is a demon sitting right there in the seat saying, I'm going to kill you. I mean, that, 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 that is going on. And so, so 95% of this interview has been stuff we can prove. They're going to control our minds. They're going to do all this. They're going to make us eat bugs. And so they're all, here's the best info I have. They didn't meet the aliens at Roswell. They didn't go and Eisenhower didn't meet with the aliens, you know, at, at Hangar Area 51. What they're doing is they're getting interdimensional information from lower level beings that are older than us or been around the transistor, all of this just just came into being, and it's not coming in crash spacecrafts. That's what they're giving them, but they'll literally tell the government when they're when they're in these DMT operations, okay, bring in 10 kids and cut their heads off for me. 
And, and you can say, well, they want you to do evil things. They, they, they like it. They like the pain. Or is it just to see if we'll do what they tell them? And then they go, okay, open your mind. I'm giving you a design for something. And then they're giving us a design to build a system to enslave us. It's kind of like the movie, cheesy 1990 sci-fi movie, uh, Species, where they've got a radio telescope aimed at 50 light years away or whatever it was, and they get sent a DNA sequence from aliens. And they go, let's inject this into a female egg and see what happens. Well, they just sent the blueprints for us to kill ourselves and for an alien to take over. And, and, and so basically the aliens don't come in flying saucers from Mars. They don't come up out of the, you know, the, the Pacific, you know, rim, you know, from the hollow earth. They come through the interdimensional vortex and then communicate to our brain that is operating in the third, fourth, sixth, seventh, seventh eighth, ninth, and 10th, and even 11th and 12th dimensions. And, and so the invasion, ancients would call it spiritual, but it's not spiritual in every culture. I, I mean, they got the Dugon tribe and you know tribes in Africa that, 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 that said up there in the sky is this pole star, multi-star, and it's got seven planets around it, and they came from this one. And no telescope un until like 70 years ago could even see it. And then it's what the Africans said that was, and they say aliens came from here and taught us about all this stuff, but they also told us about uh, these these other interdimensional things that are here to destroy us. And, and see, I don't know, but all I know, and, and then you see Prometheus, the movie, they find the cave draws, the, you know, the cave drawings of uh, of uh, Sirius and all that, and, and, and tell you the story, none of the globalists really believe that some salts in the ocean turned into a cell, turned into a sponge, turned into a fish, crawled out on the land, crawled back in. No, these are designs that have been made before. These are manifestations of the universe. So just like in leaves or in you know crystals, you see the same designs. And then in our bodies, you see the same designs. And, and there was a French a mathematician, I forget his name, a quantum mechanics expert. I saw this on PBS when I was a little kid. I looked it up later, it's true. He postulated before we were even in space, I think like 80 years ago, that when we finally were able to fly a probe over Saturn, either the North or South Pole, that an interdimensional uh, size of the gas giant, this is quantum mechanics stuff, I don't understand it, would manifest a hexagon on the top. And he predicted it, it, that, 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 that it, it would be ice on the top with the frozen gas. And when they flew Voyager over it, there was a perfect hexagon on the top. And then when another probe came back later, because it went on past, and went under it, there was exactly what the quantum mechanics physicists said. And, and it gets into you know, the observation where, where they'll have a lead block sealed. And they'll have a, a, a neutron or a particle. And if you're observing it, it won't go through. But then for some reason, it's been duplicated thousands of times. If, if you're not observing it, it suddenly jumps across. It wants you to know something. And, and then they've also noticed that if humans observe uh, uh, electrons and quarks, that literally, so it's kind of like George Lucas, but not in a cheesy way, because it's, it's so subatomic that, that it, 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 ch it changes, observance changes what's happening. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. And they've, they've hooked up electron microscopes, spectrometers, in Japan to say, well, maybe it's because there's humans near it. And then they'll hook it up and then they'll have all these humans in the room around it, but not looking at it because they can't see it. And then as soon as somebody in Russia or Japan or America back to Japan looks at it through the electron microscope. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not the quantum mechanics person. I just know that's what's going in in unified field theory. I've read a lot of books on it into all of this. And, and, and so it's there. There's a whole... And look, maybe our archetypal development is we're scared of big cave cats and, and, and cave bears that used to eat our ancestors. And when, you know, you ever notice a kid at night is more scared in the room than, than out in the street around thugs because where did primates usually get eaten? It would be in their nest or in their cave coming out of the cave mouth because that's usually where. So kids are always, little kids that have good instincts are always at night. I'll close the door. Don't, oh, what's in the door? As I can't remember, like doorways at night were going into it because that's that's our instinct. So maybe these things don't look like big demons with teeth and eyes and all this. Maybe that's the only way our brain processing it 
when it has a wider spectrum we're taking in, it only processes a tiny bit, but we're getting it all. The subconscious and unconscious is actually decoding it all. So that's what, what's a cat seeing? How does it decipher it? Because all we have is the archetypes of our genetic ancestors imprinted on us to be able to decode things. So, so, so again, maybe, maybe demons really don't look like demons to themselves, but to us, that's the only way we're able to see them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I follow what you're saying for sure. Have you done DMT ever? No. See, here, here's the deal. I don't want to take it because I remember reading about DMT and ayahuasca experiences and going, well, I have those experiences every night. Crystal cities, floating pyramids, beautiful stuff like big watchmen, angels that like, it didn't happen all the time. It happens, you know, maybe once a month that tell me what's going to happen and, uh, and, 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 and just give me profound knowledge and profound sense of, of, of completion and peace. And, and, it's, and it's that archetype of the watchman or the angels and everybody, and, you know, the ancients saying, I, this angel came to me and told me this. So I, I have DMT like experiences and, and, I, and before I knew how to control it, it would, a lot of it was bad stuff. I've seen, when I read the books about it, well, I've seen that in my dreams. Well, I just made the decision that I'm with the higher power. I'm with God. I, I control my spirit. I control my energy. I change the channel. I'm going to go to Valhalla. I'm going to go see stuff that looks like a thousand times more powerful than Hawaii and the most beautiful rainbow you ever saw. And, 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 and so, so, and I know it's real because, because, and again, it's just like observing a particle. If you're watching it, it, it won't do it. Hundreds of times in my life, you God, the universe, whatever you want to call it. When I was a kid, which, you know, like I have a digital clock in the kitchen. I'd wake up and I'd say, it is 7.15. And I would run down to the kitchen and every time it was, whatever time it was. And maybe I'd wake up at 5 a.m. and I'd say, it's 5.04. It was always it was always this thing saying, go look at the clock. I'm here. I want you to know this is real. And then I had dreams of getting mugged. And about six months later, I did get mugged by the same homeless white guy in the purple and green striped shirt. He had a knife. I, maybe I was going to get killed interdimensionally. The angels warned me. So I knew when it happened. Uh, I, I was a teenager, wasn't on drugs, but I was on a beer run to get beer in Dallas where they'd sell it to underage. And, you know, this happened. And I had a lot of other dreams of things that came true. And so I guess I'm starting to share a lot of this because people need to know there's things bigger than the new world order. And they want you shuttered, hating yourself, not knowing what a beautiful creation you are, not knowing you have free will. So you won't use your potential. And, and, and Tucker Carlson has, has had an awakening. He's had an awakening that good and evil exist. And before he wasn't sure about that. And so he's had experiences now uh, that, that, that have shown him how real this is. And, and other people are going to have it because, because there's something big. And, and, you know, is it us? They've proven the sixth sense. You know, we're, I mean, that's how you know when somebody's looking at you. You're walking through the forest, nobody's around. You feel somebody looking at you. You turn, you look 20 yards away, a guy standing there looking right at you. Or, I mean, everybody knows that. And, and they've proven, you know, that's how butterflies can fly from Canada all the way to Mexico, even though they were hatched in Canada and never been to Mexico and fly to the same tree that their ancestor was laid in, and then they fly back up to Canada, die, you know, lay the eggs, die, and fly perfectly back to the tree. Scientists don't know how to do it. Well, no, they have a, a, a they do know now. They have magnetic cones in them, little bitty tiny magnetic cones in their brain that operate off of electromagnetic lines. And, and now we know the ancients were into that, and we know that humans have hundreds of times per density the magnetic cones of a butterfly, not just that their brain's so much tinier, Per brain structure, we have way more than that. Well, why do we have that? A butterfly has a tiny bit and can navigate 3,000 miles perfectly to the exact the tree that their, their parent was born in. Okay, how do they do that? Well, it's the same thing. How do ducks fly from Canada all the way you know, down to South Texas and then land in the same pond uh, where their parents were born? How do they do this over and over and over and over again because the, the cones aren't just following the lines. The cones are pre-programmed to carry out an operation. So instincts aren't just some vague thing. It's a compressed knowledge. But you can't handle all your ancestral knowledge that Frank Herbert wrote about in his first book. That's excellent. An average person cannot handle that. All that knowledge of all your ancestors, it would be too blinding, too much. Just like you, And that's proven that's there. Just like you can't see everything around you because you couldn't handle that because it's too distracting. It's like trying to conduct 
you know, uh, uh, threading a needle while you've got a thousand people banging drums around you and giving you electroshocks, you know, or it, it's like trying to write a novel a hundred feet under the water with a typewriter while great white sharks are trying to eat you. So all this stuff surround us where we're like a larval egg of what humans are about to become of the butterfly analogy. We're in a pubescent or, or larval <clears throat> uh, pupa stage swirling around in the universe and not aware of all the danger and, and, the, the, you know, and things that are going on because we can't handle it. Okay, so, wait, I have hey. a question. Why would it just be interdimensional? Wouldn't, why wouldn't it be yes and? Because people say, oh, it's preposterous. It would come from other planets. How is that more? I'm sure the interdimensional thing could possibly be true. But the interplanetary thing is crazier than that? How, how would that be? Well, I'll go back to Frank Herbert, which is out of quantum mechanics. This is actually what the, 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 the quantum mechanics uh, you know, experts believe. Let's take this piece of paper and say um, right here is beetle geese or some star. You know, is this the tunneling thing? We all know this. <laughs> well, let me, let me, I'll show people. Let's say there's a galaxy 50 light years away, okay? Okay, fit, okay, and here's Earth, and here's uh, you know this uh, planet that we want to go to. Okay, now if you're trying to go 50 light years with current technology, even if we had light speed, it'll take you 50 years to get there. Now, interdimensionally, all you got to do is fold the piece of paper interdimensionally if you're able to do this, and that's 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 the theory of the third dimension. There's higher dimensions, and then all you do is punch a hole. And you're basically instantly there. So that's like somebody before they invented the wheel looking at a chariot and saying, what does that do? So see, you get 50 years to get there with the technology we don't even have yet. But if you interdimensionally travel there, you're there instantly by folding. That's fold space. Right. How's that different? All right. Okay. All right. So before we let you go, I, I want to, um, you know, I'm really into Carl Jung. He talked about a collective unconscious, which kind of parallels what you're saying about the knowledge of everything that came before us. And he would have these visions in his dreams that were symbols of things that he didn't know what they meant, but he knew they were important. And then he would read books about el the alchemical process, which was all about psychic gold, turning psychic lead into psychic gold. And he would those he would find out, oh, a thousand years ago, they knew what this symbol meant. And how would I, how would, why would it show up in my dream? And if I didn't know what it meant already, well, because you already have access to that knowledge. It's called the collective unconscious. That was his greatest contribution to psychology. And no, I think no, that's absolutely true. So you can't really turn lead into gold, even though with some of these big cyclotrons, right. they can do it now. Uh, you know, small piece, but it takes a lot of money <clears throat> and energy. But you can, with advanced knowledge we already have, create the gold of, of, of new inventions. And I'm saying there's bad actors that are trying to get us to build things that are destructive because they want to hurt us and get rid of us because of whatever destiny we have or whatever is unfolding. I, I'm just speculating there. I wish I had crew in the studio because they've been showing for about a month this AI rendering of, of castles and mountains and the universe and how it changes. And when I saw them play that, I went, that's where I go. That's one of the things I've seen basically exactly. Well, here's AI scraping the art and visions of billions of people. And then you put into it the cosmos, heaven, and then it literally shows you what the collective unconscious already has. So that is the power of AI is that it scrapes fragments of what we're doing in the conscious and unconscious that bubble up to the conscious. And then it is, in many of these things I've seen, manifesting some really deep, powerful stuff. There's no crew in there, is there? Too bad everybody's probably gone or I would, I would, I'm going to send you this, Jimmy. Okay. And, and I'm telling you, the stuff I see in these dreams is, is just like this, but even more blazing and, and gorgeous and just, you know, way more powerful. But when I saw this for the first time, I was like, whoa, that's a, that's very similar to what I see. And I'd never seen art like that, never seen culture like that, never seen what I'd seen, one of the things I see. And then AI, though, it, it, it saw it because it's scraping millions of people. So before we go, I, you, you tweeted this out, and I just wanted to end our conversation talking a little bit about Israel. You said, breaking exclusive General Flynn – Response to Netanyahu's leaked plan to ship Gaza war refugees to Western nations. Former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Michael Flynn, gives his analysis of this extremely dangerous development and also calls out Netanyahu and the Israeli military leadership for clearly standing down during the Hamas attacks of October 7th. So 
Go ahead and speak about that. Well, I mean, I'm not telling anybody anything that they didn't know. I've seen you talk about it. I talked about it on October 7th. Uh, Israel, a couple days ago, in a 60-second rescue, grabbed a bunch of hostages while they were being shot at, <clears throat> flew into Gaza from Israel in 60 seconds, saved them, and got out. Okay, so Israel probably does have the best border defenses in the world, hands down. General Flynn's been there. He's turned it. He said clearly they probably got the best. And they've got multiple three, four layers and all these cameras and all these weapons. And Israel you know, is, 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 is tiny. And you can drive from end to end of Israel, even on the windy roads, in like an hour. And from the Golan Heights in the north all the way down to the south by Gaza and the southern zone. And so a bunch of Israeli retired soldiers who were in the north got down there in 45 minutes in their cars. Mm. And they helped. But they somebody had had a bunch of the troops stand down. And Flynn says the head of the southern district should be removed. The head of the military should be removed during the investigation. And the New York Times comes out and says, actually, the Army says they told Netanyahu a year before of the plan. Yes. But then nobody's blaming who did it. So I don't know if it's Netanyahu or they didn't tell him. But the point is, they had a, they have hundreds of attack helicopters. I've, I've looked it up. They have over 170 Apaches. They got a, they've got hundreds of attack helicopters. I looked it up. Ten miles from where that rock concert or rave happened, where everybody got killed, tragically, they had a whole bunch of attack helicopters, fueled, ready, pilots sitting around drinking coffee. So a helicopter could have been there in minutes. A few helicopters, when they break through the first fence with bulldozers, could have been there and stopped them. Instead, they let them break through, overrun, go in, kill thousands, grab hundreds, drag them back across right after Biden gives Iran Six billion dollars right after Iran. Hezbollah is now taking credit for Hezbollah advising Hamas. They go in, and then Hamas gets elevated around the world, get to be these heroes. Israel gets to get the oil and the gas and push people out of Gaza, send the refugees here. Netanyahu gets a new 9-11, a political distraction. Uh, Iran gets to flex their muscles. Wars to help the state. I'm not saying they all work together, but there's a lot of back channel wink wink going on here. And so bottom line, we know Israel stood down. That is a fact. Seven hours is conservative. Most estimates are eight and a half hours. So you have to understand, the most militarized per square inch country in the world with, the word is a thousand nuclear weapons, submarines, gunboats, tanks, giant military, huge militia, and it gets worse. One month before the attack, the Israeli government disbanded the local security companies that the kibbutzes were paying for in the area. I mean, this is 9-11 all over again. A definite stand down, and it's disgusting. And I'm not an anti-Israel guy. I, I, okay, I don't think Israel should be destroyed. I don't believe from the mountains of the sea stuff. But at the same, And I don't believe you know, in, in, in Hamas or Hezbollah or the Muslim Brotherhood. What I'm saying is this is some very sophisticated crap. There's no way Netanyahu sees the attack 30 minutes in, an hour in. You know he's told. He doesn't order military. D default drills is launch helicopters, launch jets. None of that was done. You, As it took, so, them, it took them, it took them, it took them. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. So so the, what we've postulated here is that they wanted, the, the reason why they funded Hamas in the first place instead of the PLO it was to divide and conquer because their plan was always to take over well, Israel that land. Israel said that. Israel said, said it, yeah. in the 90s. That, that you're right. I'm so, backing you no, up. No, he Israel said it in 2017. Said, Netanyahu. Yeah, he said it. Uh, but the seven-hour thing, hold on. I, I, no, I was just, might have been Burmese who told me or someone on this show. I thought that, oh, they didn't do anything for seven hours. That's clearly set up. But what I just got told, and, and now I'm not sure what's true, is no, they, they showed up on there. They got their ass kicked and they shot each other because the IDF actually isn't that good. And well, that's well, the thing you have clear. to cover let's up. Clear. Let's be clear. Let, let, let's be clear. Some IDF showed up. Some. There were some people there. But Hamas knew the codes and where the Shin Bet and Mossad sub bases were hidden in houses and then killed the Shin Bet people hiding under beds. Remember that? Those so were I'm, Shin Bet? I'm not going to disagree with you. Absolutely. But, but it's also true. It, it, it is true that the Israelis did blow up some of their own buildings and kill some of their own people. That's true. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. So, so you would agree with our assessment then that this was all kind of a plan that Netanyahu has had and the Israelis have had to 
go out and take over Gaza and take over the West Bank. And part of that is because there's a half a trillion dollars in gas and oil underneath. But the other half is they just want it and they want to get rid of those people. And so they set this up. That's why they funded Hamas. That's why even the New York Times headline is uh, suitcases full of cash. They used diplomats from Qatar to do it. And so and people don't know this, that that they, they go, oh, you support Hamas. No, I don't support Hamas. Israel supports Hamas. Netanyahu is literally supporting Hamas with with uh, suitcases full of cash. And why would they do that? Yeah, let's why be would- clear. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. You are 100 percent right. We don't support Hamas. The Israeli government supports Hamas. And, and that's on record. And in the 1970s, the Palestinian Authority was getting its act together. They wanted a group to be more radical. This is admitted to mm-hmm. discredit the whole thing. And right. so Israeli intelligence created Hamas, just like our government in the, the early 1980s and, and really 1979 created Al Qaeda, created the Mujahideen. Right. So, so it's the same story. You got to create. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, so a lot of people, so if you, I mean, so there's no disagreement then on exactly what's going on. And so so what what would you say the solution is then? I mean, what is is there a solution? Because my solution would be the United States pulls the plug on the funding of that, and then it's over. Israel has to become a good neighbor to their Arab other, the other Arab states instead of what they have been now is genocidal ethnic cleansing maniacs and doing it under the guise of that we were attacked. Well, I mean, I would say Israel is just taking a page out of all the other colonial governments. And uh, I'm not saying Israel doesn't have a right to exist, but yeah, it's just like Ukraine. It's good for the Israeli uh, defense contractors. It's good for the U.S. defense contractors to just have an endless war, endless taxes, just like Ukraine. That's all this is. And it, it also gives all the Arab countries somebody to point at. And, and, and so these governments all need a boogeyman. And so the Muslims and the Arabs need the Jews and the, and the Jews need the Arabs to keep control of their own populations. And I agree. People say I'm anti-Semitic when I say this. I agree with Senator Rand Paul. I don't want to send aid to Israel. I don't want to send aid to anybody for military issues. If somebody gets hit by a hurricane or a typhoon or an earthquake, let's send aid. Let's send humanitarian aid. I want us, of course, we're an empire, so we can't do that. I want us out of the business of shipping weapons to anybody. We should be exporting products and ideas and jobs and culture and make all these foreign countries so great and so wonderful that maybe I'll go live in one of them because they're cool, you know, part of the year. I I want all these countries doing well, and I want the world doing so well that we can welcome in all these people so they're not going to be exploited. But you bring in a bunch of totally dirt poor people, they're going to be easy to push around. And and so that's why they want them here. So, so yeah, exactly. And, yeah, I mean, Israel is as crooked as a dog's back leg, but so is every major government. So I'm not even defending Israel. I just have this issue with people that fetishize Israel obsessing on it all day. Now people should be obsessing on it because I get arguments from the pro-Israeli lobby. Well, you're saying we're carpet bombing it. This is precision bombing. BS, it's not precision (laughs) bombing. They said Dresden. That wasn't no precision bombing. (laughs) Well, they aimed at civilians. Maybe that's the precision. Yeah. Well, that's another thing. What's going on over in Israel? They should look in a mirror. Because Hitler was bad. He killed a bunch of Jews and other people. And I, and I literally see these people on Israeli TV, mainline TV, going, well, hell, Netanyahu quoted the Bible where they say kill the women, the children, and their animals. The and they're literally on national TV saying, I can't sleep at night. I love watching those buildings blow up. And that's killing civilians. Oh, oh and here's the thing. Where is Netanyahu, like Trump did killing the Iranian general? Trump didn't bomb the Iranian public. He bombed the Iranian general that they said was behind stuff. Maybe that's right. Maybe it's wrong. The point is, Why didn't Netanyahu say day one, we're going to kill all the leadership of Hamas and we're going to send in assassins. And you know, the Israelis used to be good at this. I don't know if they're good now. And and go in. You've got the leaders of Hamas aren't even in Gaza. So (laughs) if Netanyahu would have said, I'm going to go kill the leaders and and I'm going to and I'm going to have the U.N. cut aid off or whatever. That's what you and and we're going to hunt them down and kill their leaders. That's what you do, but no. Imagine if Israel wouldn't have struck back and would have been Christ-like and said, we're not going to flatten Gaza and we want the hostages back and we're going we're to go after the leadership of Hamas. The whole world would have turned to Israel and it had been a PR disaster for Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. 
But just like Obama ran the Arab Spring and all that, there's another side to all of this, too, uh, that they're cooking up for a bigger war. Jesus didn't pay the Romans to nail him to a cross. There's a little bit of a different, like, yeah. Israel responded by not funding them anymore like they did for 20 years. Yeah. No, I know. You're totally right. I was hypothetical if Israel yeah, I know, I hadn't know. have founded it. What I love about Israel is the chutzpah. Because, you know, the CIA, they don't brag about, yeah, we created Al-Qaeda. We had to find it out. Blowback. But Israel's like, aren't we smart? We <laughs> created these guys to be really bad so the Arabs could never have a civilization so we could keep blowing them up. I mean, like. It's called blow forward. We do blowback. They blow yeah, it forward. Yeah, it is. It is. It is that talk about chutzpah. They just say it right out what they're doing. I've showed the head of their intelligence uh, uh, agency uh, saying it on television. I've sh you, you, they don't they don't make it a secret. It's it's wild. I don't know what that is. Maybe. Yeah, so I'm not enemies of Jews. There are a lot of Jews, you know, that are against all this, just like there are a lot of Chinese that are against, you know, Mao Zedong or, or Kim Jong Un or, you know, in, in North Korea. But I, I also just want to say. Look in the mirror, man. You don't want to dress up in a Nazi uniform and start hailing Hitler here. Yep. This is not good for you. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling the Jews, you know, and, you know, the ones in Israel that support it. I mean, look at Netanyahu, super unpopular, super. Uh, basically a revolution on his hands. And then this magically happens. He says, yes, there was a bad failure in security. We'll look at it when the war is over. But now they say the war is never going to end. Yeah. So what does Netanyahu not want us to know? That's right. Okay, well, all right, I'm glad we had this conversation, Alex. I really appreciate you giving us uh, three hours of your time today. Uh, it's um, I'm glad we could uh, uh, finally, officially, one-on-one, -on -one bury the hatchet and uh, get over I was never mad about you spitting on me. Okay, good. <laughs> but, but, I love it, but, but, but let me be serious here. No, it, it was all part of the circus. It cooled me off, but the point was it was right in my mouth. It was like, oh, yeah, yogurt, right in the mouth. But, but, but just this last point. It's, it's catty for a show to go on another show and say tune into my show, but I've been in the phantom zone. I'm bankrupt. I'm trying to keep my crew employed. I think we're doing important work. We're a symbol of free speech they want to shut down. I am on weekdays, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Central. We have other great shows. I want Schroyer, Harrison Smith. We've got reporters in the field. We're trying to get back out there. People can find my show at Infowars.com forward slash show or follow me at Real Alex Jones on X. And Jimmy, you and your great crew have all got to come to Austin uh, you know, back when we get back on our feet, we'll fly you here, put you up. I'd love to. We're getting back on our feet very soon. Uh, my bankruptcy's going well. It's almost over, and I'll be able to operate again and actually have funds to do things. But I want to invite you here to Austin. You know, you, you go to Joe's club, hang out with him, do his show. After you do his show, please come to my show. I want to invite your whole crew. I'll pay for you all to come here. We can change the background to your background. Uh, so it's and we got two other studios so there that are generic. You're welcome. Uh, to come use this place. I'm a big fan of yours, and I really appreciate you. I appreciate you saying that, and uh, I look forward to meeting you in person in Austin, and uh, we'll certainly do something like that. And uh, I'm a, and just one I, last little quick thing. When the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all of you at Jones, Jimmy Dore, Love Fest, look, we're just loving free speech and open discussion. It doesn't mean we agree on everything, and it's about free speech and our victories over the tyrants, and it's good when the New York Times attacks you. They promoted WMDs. They have blood on their hands. Every time the media says Alex Jones is evil for stuff he didn't even say or out of context, say, okay, did he lie about WMDs and kill millions? Or every time they say Jimmy Dore is a Russian agent because he doesn't want a nuclear war, tell them, F you, I want to live. Your crew's awesome. We love you. Okay, right back at you, Alex. Thanks again. And uh, show show your book. Show your new book. There it is. The new one is The Great, great. Awakening, Defeating the Globalists and Launching the Next Great Renaissance. This one went to number one, but it came out in the late summer. That's easy to go to number one then. It's very hard around Christmas. It's gone to like 25. Uh, it's gone to number one on a bunch of uh, you know charts for like politics. It's The Great Awakening. Uh, this is the plan of the Death Star. The Great Reset and the War for the World. This is how to, the actual attack on the Death Star and then defeating the empire after that, to use a cheesy Star Wars analogy. This is to finish the war and then build a new civilization. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Come see us do a live stand-up show. We'll be in Venice, California, Palmdale, California, Omaha, Des Moines, Milwaukee, Lansing, Bend, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts, and we're going to Europe. Do you live in Europe? We're going to be there. Go to jibbydoor.com for a link for all those tickets. Mm -hmm.